Uh, friends, uh, let me begin by extending a very warm greeting to you all on behalf of the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analyses. Uh, and I want to begin by acknowledging uh, the presence of uh, Dr. Nuno Kanas uh, um, Mendes, uh, Director of the Instituto do Oriente, uh, Ambassador Manish Chauhan, and Ambassador Carlos Pereira Marquez, Ambassador Luis uh, Philippe Castros Mendes, um, Mr. Sandeep Chakravarti from the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, experts from both sides, uh, the Instituto do Oriente and the MPIDSA, and all other guests and participants who have joined us this afternoon. Uh, a very good afternoon to you all. Bom dia to our friends in Portugal. Uh, a very warm welcome to you all. Now, today, as you know, we have gathered for the first uh, bilateral dialogue, albeit in a virtual form, between uh, my institute, uh, that is the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies, and the Instituto do Oriente in Lisbon. Some of you may know that we had signed an MOU last year during the state visit of uh, the president of Portugal uh, to India. And we are delighted to host today's event. We hope to be able to meet regularly from now on uh, and hopefully uh, in the physical form as well, not just uh, at the virtual level. I particularly want to thank Ambassador Manish Chauhan and Ambassador Carlos Pereira Marquez for joining us at the inaugural session. And like I said, I also want to thank uh, Sri Sandeep Chakravarti, who has uh, spared his valuable time uh, to join us this afternoon. In, in a sense, it makes our dialogue, uh, you know, much more credible, much more central uh, to all the policy making uh, uh, that is actually happening uh, between the two governments. Um, friends, India and Portugal share a very unique bond. Our ties date back uh, many centuries. Uh, we are all aware of the intrepid uh, Portuguese seafarers who braved the long and daunting journey across the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans. And they were the pioneers in discovering the maritime route uh, between India and Europe. This paved the way for a more sustained uh, Indo-Portuguese engagement in subsequent centuries. Uh, nowhere is it more reflected than in our people-to-people -people ties. Uh, Prime Minister Costa is um, uh, a shining example of uh, these uh, long-standing cultural and civilizational bonds and roots uh, that we share. The Portuguese imprint is visible across Goa, Daman and Deev, uh, and just off my home state of Gujarat. I'm from Gujarat. I grew up uh, visiting the island of Deev, uh, and I can tell you uh, that uh, it was fascinating to see the Portuguese imprint there. I learned a great deal uh, from that uh, uh, historical uh, imprint, footprint, presence, as you might call it. Over the last few years, our bilateral relations have been transformed through uh, frequent high-level visits. Our partnership is multifaceted and multidimensional. We continue to add more pillars to our bilateral ties, which are marked by a deepening of cooperation in the social, defense, strategic, and economic fields. With Portugal holding the presidency of the Council of the European Union, it is expected that our ties with the EU will also be further strengthened. I wish to recall the Portuguese presidency of the EU Council at the beginning of this uh, millennium that led to the first India-EU summit in Lisbon in the year 2000. Friends, we live in an uncertain world which is undergoing a fundamental transformation and a, an already uh, fragile international compact has been weakened by the COVID-19 pandemic. Economic recovery is a priority everywhere, whether in Portugal or in India. Redesigning new resilient supply chains in order to prevent future disruptions has emerged as a major challenge. I'm happy to point out uh, that uh, India, Japan, and Australia have already taken a lead uh, on this very pressing issue. And uh, I would suggest that at some point of time in the future, India and Portugal should also be looking at uh, how India and the EU can work together 
to take uh, this particular uh, challenge uh, uh, frontally and uh, you know devise solutions. Uh, even amidst the pandemic, the specter of terrorism, I have to remind you, especially cross-border terrorism of the kind aided and abetted by Pakistan continues to challenge peace and security. Uh, we appreciate Portugal's role in the extradition of uh, Abu Salem, who was wanted in connection with uh, criminal cases dating back to the Mumbai blasts of uh, 1993. This uh, highlights our shared interest in tackling the menace of uh, terrorism. Terrorism today has spread its tentacles all over the world, and no country is uh, inured uh, to the uh, adverse impact of global terrorism. Globalization itself continues to be redefined. Not every country has fully benefited from the rapid integration of the global economy in recent decades. Some have taken greater than their fair share by gaming the system. China has utilized the liberal global trading system to create monopolies and dependencies. China has long practiced supply chain politics. The pandemic, in fact, brought to light some of these aspects in a very negative fashion. The new year, 2021, began with a number of changes all around, including in our region. Uh, in West Asia, we have seen change. Uh, in the United States, too, we have seen major change at the political level. In our immediate neighborhood in Myanmar, there has been sudden change. The new presidency in the United States is settling in, but the fundamentals of geopolitical contestation with China are unlikely to change. The EU, uh, it seems to me, uh, struck a last minute deal with China on uh, you know, investment, uh, the comprehensive agreement on investment uh, on the penultimate day of the German presidency, weeks, just weeks before President Biden's inauguration. Um, friends, it augurs well that the US is now recommitting itself to multilateralism, whether the UN, WHO, UNESCO, or the all-important Paris uh, Climate Change Agreement, uh, the United States has staged a comeback. And this is welcome. India's non-permanent membership of the UN Security Council uh, gives uh, India a fresh opportunity to engage and to help strengthen multilateralism. At a geopolitical level, the rise of China uh, remains a strategic challenge. Uh, from our point of view, uh, China's unilateralism, aggression, and revanchism in re-altering territorial boundaries uh, from the East China Sea to the South China Sea and to Ladakh, uh, this continues to fuel rivalries and contestations. Today, the Indo-Pacific is gaining currency. The term Indo-Pacific is uh, being used uh, in a widespread manner. Uh, it is a representative term that is inclusive and reflective of the contemporary age. It is also a throwback, in my view, to the historical realities of the fusion of the Indian, Atlantic and Pacific Oceans that was so well recognized in past centuries, uh, a time uh, in which uh, uh, all uh, major powers were able to, uh, to promote uh, a kind of geographical connect and we have seen that most emphatically in the geographic uh, connect uh, between India and Portugal, who are otherwise distant neighbors. Uh, in fact, Portugal played a pioneering role in world history by linking continents and markets across the globe, uh, by achieving uh, an interdependent web, uh, which also had its economic engagement and benefit. Portugal has, in my view, one of the oldest presence in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, stretching all the way from India up to Macau, and I might add Japan as well. Uh, however, the Indo-Pacific today is also a contested space where China is seeking to redefine the world order by virtually seeking an expulsion of all other major powers, particularly the United States, from its periphery. It regards the US presence in the Asia Pacific, especially as an impediment to its domination of Asia. 
this is ironic because the US and others such as France, uh, Britain, even Portugal have historically been part of the region and the United States that you all know has been a key factor in the region's economic prosperity and political stability after the end of the Second World War. Other European powers such as Germany uh, who are showing interest in an open and transparent rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific also have deep stakes and are integral to the region's future. Today, in order to guarantee peace and prosperity in the 21st century, like-minded nations must work together to forge new partnerships and collaborative structures. In this complex scenario, the Indo-Pacific vision, the quadrilateral security dialogue, the D10 club of democracies, the Five Eyes intelligence network, and the global partnership on artificial intelligence, uh, perhaps even the G7 plus three that is being spoken about, uh, these will bring together in one form or another key stakeholders to build a better world. For India, the fundamental goals and objectives in the 21st century are the same uh, that we have advocated in recent years. We wish to achieve rapid and broad-based inclusive economic growth in a stable and peaceful environment. Our strategic autonomy is better honed today as we pursue issue-based alignment uh, with various partners, all in keeping with our national interests and in keeping with international law. In recent years, India's role in the global arena has been strengthened, aided by the fact that we have many mature democratic institutions India has economic potential. India has also enhanced its military capabilities. And above all, India has resolute political leadership and will. India's ability to work together with key partners such as Portugal, South Korea, the United States, Japan, Australia, France, Great Britain, uh, these will strengthen uh, you know, our role, India's role as uh, an active participant in the emerging global structures uh, and discourse in the 21st century. Today, India and Portugal stand on the cusp of a new phase uh, in their partnership. Our prosperity hinges on how well we can work together to build the foundations for our future. And as you all know, today's discussions are expected to uh, delve deep into these issues. And I'm very confident that new perspectives will emerge uh, perspectives that will outline uh, a blueprint uh, for a more robust India-Portugal partnership. I now will request uh, Dr. Uh, Nuno uh, Canas Mendes, uh, Director Instituto do Oriente, to deliver his welcome remarks. He is my esteemed counterpart, and therefore uh, I should also add co-host for this event. Uh, welcome to you, Dr. Mendes, and the floor is yours. Uh, do please deliver your opening remarks. At this stage, may I also suggest that uh, all those who are not uh, speaking uh, may kindly uh, mute their mics. Uh, that includes me. Uh, and it is only when I call upon the esteemed speaker to take the floor uh, that he or she may kindly unmute uh, their mic. Uh, I would also suggest that uh, as we go through the afternoon, through the very interesting conversations and presentations. I'm sure a number of you will want to engage uh, the speakers. You may have questions. And so I would request you all to use the Q&A box, which is available to you. Uh, and uh, please do not use the chat box, but the Q&A box to actually pose your questions in brief. I'll be very happy to uh, relay them to the speakers um, when we have the Q&A session which will follow session number two. Uh, with these few words, once again, a very warm welcome to you all and over to Dr. Mendes. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Chinoy. Um, dear uh, uh, Ambassador Chinoy, uh, Ambassador uh, um, Chawan, Ambassador um, Pere, Pere Marques, and the distinguished panelists, Ambassador Castro Mendes, Dr. Pillay, 
Mr. Chakravarti, uh, Professor Carla Costa and Dr. Constantine Xavier, uh, distinguished guests and attendants. It is an honor to participate in this first bilateral dialogue between uh, Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis and Institute de Orient, a research unit uh, who belongs to the University of, of Lisbon. In this special year, we are facing a global crisis and that stresses the need to intensify cooperation and communication between our institutions uh, to reflect on common problems and challenges. And I hope that this initiative is only the first step to deepening links and research projects between us. Additionally, Portugal is committed to reinforce its political, economic, trade and cultural relations with India. And during this uh, first semester of 2021, holding the presidency of, of the Council of the European Union, responsible of getting, uh, uh, of in intensifying links between uh, uh, India and European Union and Portugal. In these circumstances, this webinar is an excellent opportunity of sharing viewpoints and discuss the past and the present, as well as new important concepts and scientific tools, namely Indo-Pacific concepts and geoeconomics. It is also a motive of, of joy to have the presence and participation of the ambassadors of India and Portugal reinforcing the importance of an open dialogue between diplomats and academics, students and civil society. I would like to express my, my gratitude to the panelists who enthusiastically accepted to share with us their knowledge and uh, to you, uh, of course, Ambassador Chinoy and Dr. Pillai, uh, for your willingness and efficiency. Um, let me say a few words to present the Orient Institute. It was founded in 1989 with a multidisciplinary approach from international relations to anthrop anthropology. The fact that in the transition of the 20th century to the 21st century, two former Portuguese colonies, Macau and Timur, changed its uh, political status was an immediate reason for research. This opened, this opened a door to develop Asian studies with a special focus on Portuguese involvement and heritage in Asia um, on a contemporary perspective. A small number of academics were aware of the growing assertiveness of Asia in international relations from a political, economic and social point of view. And this was the seed to the development of research directed to several regions in Asia, from China and Southeast Asia to Central Asia and, and Middle East. In the second decade of the 21st century, a realignment of global political powers became clear and the centrality of an, an Indo-Pacific concept whose content is still under discussion appeared much more comprehensive than the current Asia-Pacific. The players may have different understandings of the meaning and implications of Indo-Pacific and how the relations between India, European Union and Portugal can evolve and be fruitful. In these circumstances, it is of paramount re relevance to build bridges with Indian academic community and establishing partnerships to enhance research projects, heavens and exchange of researchers. This uh, first virtual dialogue will certainly contribute to enrich opinions, views and analysis on India and Portugal relations. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Shinhai. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mendes. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, 
uh, you perfectly balanced my remarks uh, because I had overshot my time, and you seem to have uh, also sacrificed a few minutes of your own time. Yes. But for that, I can only be eternally grateful to you, and I owe you one on that. Uh, okay. So we having done our job, the two of us at the institutional level, we can sit back now and listen to uh, our two uh, envoys, the plenipotentiaries who are actually on the ground uh, and doing their best to deepen our uh, friendship and cooperation. So I would like to at this stage invite uh, Ambassador Manish Chauhan, uh, the Ambassador of India to Portugal, uh, who I count among my friends. Uh, and you know he's also from the East Asia Division of the Ministry of External Affairs. And he cut his teeth in the Foreign Service when I was direct to China many, many, many years ago. So I call upon uh, Ambassador Manish Chauhan to now address us, to deliver his special remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, sir, for that very kind introduction. And also, bom dia to all my friends in Portugal. Uh, thank you for this very kind invitation to both, uh, you know, for which I guess I can thank you on behalf of my team and also on behalf of Ambassador Carlos Marquez, who's a very good friend, and his team, because I guess we will be the most uh, uh, enthusiastic listeners to today's events and proceedings because we will be the people who will be actually carrying forward all the decisions and discussions and the points that emerge from this today's uh, webinar. This is actually for me a brilliant opportunity because these are very early days. I've been here barely a couple of weeks and to be in a position to listen to so many seniors and colleagues who are actually experts in this field is, is, is a practically a godsend. So I thank Manoha Parikar Institute for Different Studies and Analysis, named after a great son of India, as well as Instituto de Oriente Lisboa, Lisboa and Dr. Mendes for this great opportunity. I also would like to thank uh, my good, very good friend and boss, Mr. Sandeep Chakravarti in the Ministry of External Affairs, because of all your efforts, it's possible for us and my, me and my team today to be part of this, this uh, proceedings. I think, sir, you have you actually had given a full full scale introduction to what all has happened and what is of the potential of this relationship. So, I would be you know adding to what you've already said, but I would like to simply endorse all that was said by you and also by the by Dr. Mendes, because as we go through this period of the pandemic, especially in a very difficult, Portugal has been in a very difficult situation in recent days. And we have with our friends here who, you know, try to get out of this situation. And I'm, I'm sure very soon we'll be, we'll be past the peak and, and back to leading as normal a life as perhaps is possible here. But at the same time, Portugal has this huge responsibility this year as it chairs the the EU at the presidency, and we also would be hosting together the India EU summit later this year. You very rightly said, sir, there is a centuries old history and tradition of relationship that is there with us to build upon. But I guess the year we are in and the times ahead beckon us to, to do much more and to give it a contemporary shape that will actually reflect more the expectations of today's times and the challenges that are there, be it on the climate side or even on the economic side. So we need to do much, much more. And the as, as a result of these expectations, perhaps the quantum of delivery that is expected of us is also much more. As our prime minister has also said, perhaps we need to up the scale of everything that we do to bring it, give it the, the size and the shape that a country of our size and stature and perhaps as we engage through Portugal in the context of the huge relationship that we have with Portugal with the wider Europe we need to give it a shape and size that is actually more reflect reflects the contemporary realities and the expectations in this regard I can only say that my team here and us along with Ambassador Marcus and his team there we will do our utmost to to do whatever is expected of us to give it the shape that it deserves. But at the same time, we would also try and do whatever we can to bring institutes like the IDSA and the Institute of the Oriental Lisboa together. Perhaps these webinars are the ways to do, but there is no substitute for an actual meeting. 
we will wait for the day when the actual delegations visit each other but in the meantime these opportunities are actually very very welcome because they do provide uh, uh, an access to people which otherwise may not be so so feasible or possible in today's reality but be that as it may we will do our utmost to try and bring such uh, delegations together such opportunities for people to exchange views but we need to be more realistic that we need to go beyond these exchanges of views and bring them bring tangible results which which actually help us show where we stand in terms of our bilateral relationship and the wider relationship between india and europe with these words i would like to thank you and the rest of the organizers including kanal pille for the efforts put in to to organize this webinar we are all ears henceforth from now on and if there is anything we can do you can count on our support from this end i thank you and i uh, i i would like to request ambassador marcus to to also henceforth share share his views and at the same time wish him the very best as he carries forward his endeavors there thank you very much sir thank you very much ambassador uh, manish chauhan for your uh, support and uh, for your remarks uh, encouraging remarks and um we will uh, take note of that very important point that you made that we need to uh, scale up our relationship and uh, i think we will all contribute to that at the level of uh, the think tanks as well i now request uh, ambassador carlos pereira uh, marques uh, ambassador of portugal to india to kindly deliver his special remarks Uh, bom dia for all those who are in uh, Portugal. Uh, uh, bom dia, my dear friend uh, Manish. It was a pleasure listening to you. Good afternoon to all of you that are in India. And I'll try to be as brief as I was requested to be. I thank the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis and the Institute to Durient for this opportunity. And I congratulate them on their new partnership. Wishing them a long, fruitful, and stimulating collaboration. The political bilateral relations between Portugal and India, we all know, are excellent, and they have received in recent years a considerable boost, thanks in part to the proximity and good understanding existing between the leaders of our two countries, but also to an intensive cycle of high-level visits. There is plenty of opportunities in trade and investment. The potential is huge, and there is thus a strong political will to move things forward, which will be opening up our minds. We count for that with the proactivity and the entrepreneurship of Indian and Portuguese businessmen, and they know that they have also our support. Health, defense, ICTs, and renewable energies are key sectors for us. Portugal holds now the presidency of the EU, and the priorities we've set for our tenure clearly reflect the importance of our bilateral relations and how close we are. First of all, because those priorities are also major targets for India. The green transition, the digital transition, the social transition, as we need to prepare our citizens to the future, the resilience, mainly in economic terms, in the aftermath of the COVID crisis, the openness to the world and the defense of multilateralism, including a common approach to the Indo-Pacific region. All these are shared priorities, both for Portugal, India, and Europe. And this only proves that our interests are complementary and not conflicting. And then because India itself is on top of our priorities. We believe India has a crucial role to play in Asia. We need a multipolar and not a unipolar Asia, and hence the importance for Europe of having balanced and diversified relations with its thriving continent. In the changing world we live, we need more India in Europe, as India also needs us more. We need to give more substance to our strategic partnership. 
and to move forward in key, also perhaps less consensual areas, such as trade and investment. And we needed to do it not only for economic, but also for political and strategic uh, reasons. As it was during a Portuguese uh, presidency in 2000, that took place the first EU-India summit. It is an additional reason for us to be proud to host uh, now in Oporto in May, the first informal meeting of EU and India leaders ever. This is going to be a real breakthrough, an historic occasion that will propel our relationship to new levels. We hope to get very concrete results from the Oporto meeting and are glad to note that this is also the approach of our Indian counterparts. We have therefore good reasons to believe that this first semester of 2021 will be a very productive one, paving the way for a new era of EU-India relations. As all friends of India, we will spare no efforts to achieve this goal. I wish you all a very successful session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador Carlos Pereira Marquez, uh, for your uh, special remarks. And uh, I particularly took note of uh, uh, the fact uh, that you pointed out uh, interests uh, of Portugal and India are complementary and not conflicting. Uh, and that uh, uh, there is a case for having more India in Europe and more Europe in India. And I suppose under the presidency of Portugal, uh, we will have more of Europe and Portugal in India. Thank you once again. Uh, friends, uh, this brings us uh, to the end of the uh, inaugural session, uh, but we are uh, segueing directly without a break into session one, which will focus on Portugal-India relations past and present. Uh, uh, we have uh, very uh, fine and distinguished speakers here. Uh, we have Ambassador Luis Philip Castro Mendes, uh, former ambassador of Portugal to India and also uh, a former minister for culture, government of Portugal. He will speak on Portugal-India relations past and present. And we will also have uh, Colonel DPK Pillai, uh, research fellow in the MPIDSA, uh, who will speak uh, specifically on the role of Portugal in shaping modern India, uh, the historical aspects and particularly the impact uh, from uh, 1498 uh, till the present. Uh, so it's going to be a very interesting uh, session. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't want to go into, uh, you know, a long discourse about their CV because both these speakers are obviously known to uh, both sides. Um, but uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Ambassador Luis Philip Castro Mendes is not just a, a, a former ambassador to India, but he's also a Portuguese poet and writer. And I think, Ambassador, you must use your muse uh, to come up with uh, new ideas for the future of our bilateral ties. Um, he uh, also has been a prolific writer. He has a background in law uh, and he's been a political activist. Uh, so uh, he's just the right kind of person who can tell us how to shake up this partnership and to you know, reinvigorate it, to give it more muscle. He's also been ambassador to Hungary and UNESCO and uh, eventually to the Council of Europe. Uh, and uh, his two years as Minister of Culture between 2016 and 18, again position him uh, appropriately to tell us how we should build closer people to people ties uh, between uh, the friendly peoples of our two countries. Uh, Colonel Pillai, as you know, is uh, uh, a distinguished uh, uh, veteran uh, who is also the recipient of uh, 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 a medal in India, as in he's a decorated war wounded and, uh, and uh, you know, celebrated uh, soldier. Uh, and he has uh, also uh, equally uh, wielded the pen after giving up the gun. So uh, I like that kind of a scholar who is able to wield uh, both the gun and the pen with the same flourish. Uh, but he's devoted to, to peace and security and to, to building bridges of friendship. And in him, we have a very fine uh, member of our institute, uh, 
Uh, I will therefore not go into further details. I will leave uh, the time available for them to elaborate. I first turn to Ambassador Luis Philip Castro Mendes. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, are you uh, okay? <laughs> you are listening to me? Fine. Yes. Thank yes. You very much for your kind words. Uh, the only thing, Ambassador, I would request you to do is to uh, perhaps uh, consider leaning a little forward and closer to the mic so that we get the yes. right kind of uh, acoustics yes. here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are you listening to me now? Yes, it's a little low, the volume. So if there's any way that you can uh, speak a little louder or bring the mic a little closer to yourself, uh, that would greatly help. That's not, yes, I'm using my cell phone because I didn't... Uh, I think if you bring it closer to yourself, okay. it will help a great deal. And Maybe you can just place the uh, cell phone uh, uh, right close to you um, yes. so that uh, the picture will remain steady as well. Uh, but the floor okay. is yours. Um, you can do it whichever way you like. Thank you. <clears throat> dear directors, dear ambassadors, dear professors, dear Colonel Pillai, thank you for your kind words again. And I am very grateful to all of you First and foremost, for this opportunity to be back in India, even by this virtual means. On this occasion, I express my deep regrets for the terrible accident in Uttarakhand. I learned so much with India, and my experience of living and traveling there was such a challenge for all my ideas and my feelings that I can, I can only say I miss you. I am going nevertheless to disappoint you because I shall focus mostly on the past and not really on the present of our excellent bilateral relations. They have never been so good as today, but I think directors Chinoy and Kenneth Mendes, together with our two ambassadors actually in charge, have already given us their present views much better than a former envoy and a retired ambassador. I only hope not to be too boring. Are you listening now? Okay. Yes. Yes, the please. The years I spent in India, the years I spent in India taught me, among many other things, that the past events of the history we shared together cannot be in any way a handicap or an irritant in our bilateral relations. On the contrary, we belong to the history of India as India lives in our history. I am a writer and a poet, nobody's perfect. So allow me to start by quoting our national poet, Camões, who wrote an epic poem taking as hero someone you know well in India, especially Professor Sanjay Subramanayam, I mean Vasco da Gama. And thus, we can see in Camões Lusias that the complicated interplay between the traditional code of aristocratic heroism and the emerging mercantile sensibility, which is deeply present in the poem, fits well with the historical cleavage inside the Portuguese court these days between those who have in mind the building of an empire and those which apparently prefer a commercial expansion to the apocalyptic dreams of crusade and universal empire. These two views appear in the Lusiades. On the arrival to India, the poem states the aim to sow the law of Christ and bring new customs and a new king. But the meeting with the Samarin of Calicut imposes a shift on this point of view, having in mind that in contrast to the vast majority of other non-European cultures, which European travelers encountered in their voyages of discovery, the Indian subcontinent already enjoyed a very a well-defined diplomatic network. So Vasco da Gama becomes them a trader, an ambassador in Camões' words. The king expresses his pleasure at receiving ambassadors from so remote a nation. Diplomatic questions are uh, narrated by the poem and uh, the plea to, to Gum, by Gamma to be accepted as a real ambassador. So that's uh, a curious start for our relations. 
because uh, uh, as uh, uh, we, we were traders at the same time uh, warriors and at the same time all, all the time diplomats. What nowadays historians agree on is the absolute commercial priority of the Portuguese presence in India with successive alliances, misalliances and confrontations with local powers in order to keep the dominion of the sea routes for trade and to fight the main enemy, the Ottomans. Goa has been for centuries the point of departure for a big Portuguese merchant fleet trading from Asia to Europe through Africa and Brazil. That sea trade route survived the decline of the Portuguese presence in Asia, staying active up to the end of the 18th century. Meanwhile, a new social and cultural reality had been created. Many Brahmin and non-Brahmin families in Goa, either to avoid the prosecutions from the Holy Inquisition or to become able to enjoy the advantages of the ruling class, or even after a sincere conversion to the new faith, became Catholics. Not all Brahmin converted to Christianity and not all Brahmin did so. And uh, a strong Hindu population uh, remained uh, in, in Goa and uh, belongs also to this uh, society. But the fact is that Goan society became, from the 17th century, a special and very complex social, cultural and religious fabric. With my bias to poems, I have here to quote a great Indian poet from Goan Catholic origin, Eunice de Souza, on her origins. De Souza Prabhu. No, I'm not going to delve deep down and discover. I'm really de Souza Prabhu. Even if Prabhu was no fool and got the best of both worlds, Catholic Brahmin, I can hear his fat shackle still. Today, we have inside the Portuguese elites many descendants of these Goan families, many of them from Christians, as our actual Prime Minister, but many also from Hindu or Muslim Indians. The colonial status of Goa, which was, of course, uh, undeniable. Sorry. Uh, the colonial status of Goa, which was, of course, undeniable and the stubborn refusal by Salazar to open any negotiations with India blocked the recognition of this special reality and specific social fact, Goan identity. And that cognitive block unfortunately affected both sides. Neither Salazar had any idea on differences between India and Guinea-Bissau, nor Nehru was aware of the specificities of Goa. It's indeed true that Nehru tried to negotiate for years and Salazar, a man who lives in the 16th century, according to the testimony of an amazed American ambassador to Lisbon, never accepts even to start talking. When I was ambassador to India, I told uh, some my, 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 my friends from the military, in Indian militaries, how General Vassalo, the last Portuguese governor of Goa, decided to surrender against Salazar's orders, arguing that these Goan people will never more be able to keep their links with us if we provoke here a slaughter. Salazar wished really that slaughter. But uh, thanks to General Vassalo and his good, 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 good sense, no slaughter happened in Goa and nowadays we are uh, in a perfectly normal relation with India since the revolution of 74 and the recognition by Portugal of Indian sovereignty on Guadama and Diu, and uh, with a very strong cultural uh, relation with uh, the people from Goa. I'm uh, sorry to speak so much about the past, but I think that past is the, the really explains many of our realities. And I, I want uh, especially to to stress the fact that the, the that reality of Goa, which is a very, very, very small part of India, of this uh, fantastic plural and uh, heterogeneous India, that uh, is, uh, the greatness of India is, is really its plurality, and the, 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 that the special point, that special uh, part of India which is the, the former Portuguese territories in India, 
they 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 bring a culture and they bring some uh, they they brought many things to the wall of indian culture so uh, i will leave the strategic the economic and everything that uh, made so interesting my my profession to my dear colleagues the present world situation asks more and more from india and from portugal together we will continue to make history and as T.S. Eliot, a poet again, wrote, history can be servitude, history can be freedom. Let's make history becomes, become freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Luis Philip Castro Mendes, uh, for your very warm words, uh, and uh, also for uh, uh, pointing out that our bilateral relations could not have been better. Uh, that we are uh, deeply satisfied uh, with the state of our relations today, and yet we hope to do even better in the future. And frankly, it's, uh, it's someone like you uh, with the poetic license to dream of our future who should become uh, the guiding beacon uh, for others to follow. So please continue to show us uh, the way forward with your rich experience of our bilateral ties your deep appreciation of uh, the history of our ties. And you are right in pointing out that it's important to understand uh, our history uh, in order to do even better in the future. Um, you do not have to call yourself a retired ambassador. Um, you will never retire, uh, given the kind of uh, frame of mind you have. And if you do insist on being called a retired ambassador, let me assure you uh, that you have a kindred soul in me. We are both extinguished ambassadors. Uh, we have only two distinguished ambassadors today, and that is the serving ambassadors, uh, ambassadors Manish Chauhan and Ambassador uh, Marquez. Uh, but with that, uh, I now request uh, Colonel DPK Pillai to deliver his uh, remarks. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm just trying to share my screen. I'm uh, unable. Sir, the role role has been passed to you. You can now share the screen, sir. Yeah. Um. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Chinoy, sir, for this honor for speaking at this uh, very uh, inaugural session. I welcome Dr. Nuno and uh, on, on thank you our distinguished ambassadors of our countries to be here and all the panelists for so listening. My, my, my uh, presentation is on the role of Portuguese in shaping modern India. <clears throat> and um, it couldn't be, uh, you know, it's not a coincidence. I've always been, I was born in Cananor, which was the first place that the Portuguese set up uh, uh, that their fort, the Fort Angelo was set up in, in Cananor in a piece of land given by the ruler then, the Arakal Raja. And I was born in a hospital that was inside the fortress. So it's a, it's a big coincidence that I'm actually addressing, addressing this issue of this. It's a big honor for me. And uh, I'd like to start off by understanding, firstly, that it was not the first time that the, uh, the arrival of... Uh, Vasco da Gama was not the first time that the for Europeans have ever been here to India. It did alter the entire space at that time. And uh, and the roots of India that we know today has, has been laid by that expedition. It is uh, the Alexander the Great had come 326, left behind Seleucus Nicator, whose interaction, whose daughter married Chandra Gupta Maurya. And we had a lot of interaction. We see the influences of uh, the Greeks on India, but the impact of the Portuguese presence in India was much more uh, modern in, in the sense it, it shifted a lot. India had been in touch with the Western world and in Arabia through its uh, merchant shipment. Uh, Indian merchants were also known to go around the world. In fact, there was a similar uh, military expedition led by Raja Chola, Raja Rajendra Chola in 1018 and 1018 and 1025 AD against the Sri Vijaya kingdom when the trade with Song dynasty, which is were flourishing in China was threatened. So uh, they did lead military expeditions, the kind that we've seen what the Portuguese did in India. 
and uh, but until then until the arrival of the portuguese in india uh, anywhere in fact columbus discovered america looking for india actually so don't blame us for that but uh, the thing is that um, uh, the the trade was completely dominated by arab merchants who were familiar with the wind patterns and uh, you know they were uh, capable of actually navigating and the from east africa to malacca trade was conducted by merchants who didn't operate with armed vessels the kind that came along with the portuguese and uh, the rajas who uh, the kings who dominated those port cities were actually making money from the customs duty that they enjoyed and uh, in india around 1500 bc uh, 1500 ad was a country which the moguls had really not come in the empire of the moguls had not set in they were the vijayanagar kingdom in the south india in uh, vijayanagar hampi and other areas and we had the zamorins who were there in cochin calicut the, uh, the 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 chieftains who were there in and the marathas were also significantly there but uh, the the operation of the asian merchants was that they were worked in mutually interactive communities with ethnic religious family and linguistic ties and they always concentrated on only making profits out of the thing and uh, they were generally arabs and muslims but they also included uh, gujarati vanias tamil and telugu chetti syrian christians from south india chinese etc and they should pay a certain protection to uh, get uh, their uh, the thing that is allow them to freely trade and get the benefits of this now the arrival of portuguese completely altered the scene and why did the portuguese need to arrive because in 1453 the constantinople was captured by the ottomans and it completely stopped the trade there was the war going on in europe between the moors and uh, uh, this thing there was conquest that is taking place and pope nicholas v gave Portu king of portugal the right to navigate as far as india to help christians against the enemies of the faith and in 1487 bartolomeu dias was the portuguese explorer who went around the cape of good hope and in 1492 christopher columbus had actually set sail he went westward thinking that they would be finding a shorter route to india but he landed up in in america and that also altered the course of world history but uh, <clears throat> in uh, 1498 in a 309 day voyage when portuguese uh, adventurer vasco da gama along with his four ships ended up in india it altered the subcontinent forever and even though they never really established themselves as uh, like the way the british did but uh, uh, but the fact is portuguese entry altered the entire world's history and now this is the route that was taken by uh, christopher columbus and uh, this is the route taken by uh, vasco da gama now vasco da gama went around the cape of good hope and then he landed up in mozambique uh, which was again a trading way we had indian traders going and then he went to the kenyan port of malindi and there it is believed that he met with a indian trader a gujarati trader who if you see in, in the inward journey he brought him straight to calicut whereas uh, you know those the, that shows how adept the arab and the indian sailors were at uh, navigating the seas using the wind but the british uh, the the portuguese were actually equipped with much better uh, better ships they had the uh, caracks and caravels and they came with these are the uh, the ship that you see on the left hand corner is what christopher columbus had an armada of uh, four ships sao rafael sao gabriel which was commanded by his brother and san miguel and one storage ship and the picture that you see in the top is the first uh, uh, the, that is him presenting his uh, credentials to uh, the raja uh, maharaja the kochi zamorin who uh, who actually um, was uh, keen that uh, portugal uh, the portuguese ships also paid the same kind of custom levies as was paid but the but he vasco da gama was not willing to pay any kind of levies the way it was enjoyed by the previous uh, uh, thing and there was a ensuing conflict and the arab the muslims were not very happy about having a competitor who arrived from uh, europe and uh, they were not ex uh, successful in establishing the thing in uh, cochin so then he moved up to kananur and kananur what you see on the top is the fort that was actually uh, established Fort Angelo was established there on a piece of land the day it was given by the Arakal Raja to start it off and then they fortified it and there were a, a, lot, a lot of conflict that happened here between the muslims and uh, the mu uh, the, uh, the there was support given from the ottomans and the the fleets from egypt and others <laughs> and these are the the other two uh, on the pictures that you see are the successful uh, viceroys Francisco Almeida and Alfonso de Albuquerque which we'll talk about later 
So, <clears throat> what uh, Albuquerque uh, was very quick to uh, realize that, you know, the King of uh, Manual of Portugal sent instructions to Viceroy Almeida that it seems nothing would serve us better than to have a fortress in the mouth of Red Sea or near it, rather than inside it, than outside might afford better control, because from there we could see that no spices might pass to the land of Sultan of Egypt and all those in India would lose the false notion that they could trade anymore, save through us. Now, uh, spices, the pepper was the oil of the 15th century. There was much in demand in addition to other things that were produced here. But essentially, pepper and other spices that grew in the Malacca, the Indonesian areas and others were, were something that they really sought after. And uh, Albuquerque had decided that, uh, you know, he had become the governor, the viceroy in 1509. He captured it in 1511, Malacca. And he also took the Strait of Hormuz. And now he's also credited with capturing the, the, the Goa, the state of Goa. Because when, once he lost the battle, the, high, the battles in the South Kerala, along with the Mamluks and the combined forces, he had actually moved to Goa. Goa was taken over, assaulted and taken. And it became a permanent uh, base for the Portuguese. That is the longest lasting colony, along with... Uh, the one that was in Macau that was ceded in 1999 and uh, Goa was given up only in 1961. So the presence of the Portuguese completely upset the Venetians, you know, the Venetians and the uh, in, in other, in addition to the Muslim traders. It was, uh, it is said that in his diary, it was written that whereas it is the king of Portugal has found this new voyage and the spices which were expected should come from Calicut, Cochin and other places in India to Alexandria or Beirut would now, which would come later to Venice. And from Venice, it used to go by other means to other parts of Europe. And, you know, and then it, it was a place where everyone bought spice and uh, carried gold and others. So this is bad news for uh, the entire, entire thing. Now for us in India, uh, we were living in a state of Ikrim. In 1500, uh, the uh, uh, Adil Shah dynasty was on in uh, the areas of Bijapur. There was conflict on between uh, what is happening and and the Mughal Empire, which had not been set up as yet in 1526, uh, is when uh, Baba arrived in the Battle uh, Battle of Panipat. And uh, uh, so the arrival of uh, the uh, these heroes from this thing, it, it's a very interesting story. Let us hear no more of Ulysses and Aeneas and their long journeys, no more of Alexander and Trajan. And the, my theme is the daring renown of the Portuguese to whom Neptune and Mars alike shall give homage, you know. So they had made heroes out of these seafarers and they were absolutely uh, uh, brutal. They were, firstly, they were uh, adventurous in the sense they were capable of undertaking long journeys uh, around the Cape of Good Hope. The, the Suez Canal had not come up at all until much, much, much later. And they had uh, cap capable of producing light sailing ships that could sail into the winds. And the Karaks were also, you know, had four huge masts. And then they had the superior gun making abilities and the seamanship was, uh, you know, uh, which could be unmatched in those days. And then they had the noblemen, the Fidalgo's honor code, which was infused by a missionary zeal after what had happened uh, between the Muslim and the Christian, uh, the fight that had taken place uh, between in Spain and other areas. So there was a ethic of retribution and punitive revenge. And uh, this Alfonso uh, Albuquerque, who was the second viceroy, he says that he writes to uh, the king, it is uh, from his record. Yeah, I tell you, sire, one thing that is most essential in India, if you want to be loved and feared here, you must take full revenge. And they were absolutely brutal in the manner in which they they responded. In fact, uh, the uh, it is famed that an uh, entire vessel of uh, Hajj returning, uh, pilgrims from Hajj were actually burned down by after one of the laws and the the curse that had come up in kerala was may the vrata the firangis be falling upon you it was a kind of a curse and uh, there was also a deep influence india had uh, had seen the advent of uh, in the southern parts in other northern parts islam had come along in 629 ad we had a first mosque which was set up here by uh, by the uh, by the companion of the prophet and uh, he had set it up in 629 AD, the mosque was set up. And even along, uh, even before, during the lifetime of Christ, or uh, 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 means immediately after that, St. Thomas had come out of India and he had sailed here and Christians had taken roots here. So there was this, uh, everyone knew about the existence of Christians in somewhere far away in the East. 
and it was called you know the mystical kingdom of prester john and uh, they thought you know the the kingdom of the east which was ruled by a just christian king would help them overthrow uh, in a pincer moment uh, the ottomans and uh, the pope had sanctioned their uh, movement but when they came here they found a complete set of christian the syrian christians they are completely different from the practices that are there they had adopted uh, you know pagan practices in their churches and uh, so they were actually you know and they tried to bring them under the authority and there was a very famous agitation called the kunan kirisu agitation which took place when uh, there was a avowal of the saint thomas uh, christian community which said they would not submit to the jesuits of the latin latin catholic hierarchy and not accept portuguese dominance and in goa we had uh, saint francis of assisi today even today we have a, a beautiful church in which uh, his remains are still uh, preserved and he has a large amount of following and goa there was the inquisition and other a uh, large number of families were converted and uh, they have now uh, moved up so the uh, end of the portuguese supremacy came only it continued till 1663 it is when the dutch east india company which was more brutal in its ways and they had no uh, uh, missionary ideals but to make profit so uh, they had no intent so they were uh they were the ones who actually continue uh, the ones who uh, ended the domination of uh, the portuguese on the on in the, in the in the subcontinent and the region and uh, it was it forced them to remain in goa daman and diu there were three protected enclaves which remained there until 1961 and uh, 19 uh, there were series of attempts made by uh, after the independence uh, to actually get uh, goa also to be handed over to india but it failed and finally uh, the maratha first maratha light infantry under general kp kandith who also incidentally is from the same family of varakal from kanano where the first fort he uh, led the entire division that uh, on uh, uh, the assault on uh, december 1961 and uh, the ship named alfonso de albuque which is honoring that was grounded at the beach in dona paula and it remained there till it was uh, parts of it were salvaged and uh, that ended the portuguese uh, rule in india and it uh, portuguese continued to hold on to macau till 1999 so it was a long it is one of the largest longing uh, lasting uh, country, uh, uh, powers now if you look at it like i told you there were a lot of positives that came about, about by uh, by the presence of the portuguese they brought very uh, european standards into india in the sense it uh, once they were uh, they they learned the art of you know there was a there wasn't a particular order in the manner in which the militaries were formed here it was like handed over to feudal lords the knights formed them and they were given the responsibility of raising uh, forces so it wasn't really a, a very but but the the a very small handful of portuguese men continued to dominate them they struck awe and wonder into the hearts of the natives and they realized that you know they need to adopt this modern guns and gunpowder it replaced the traditional urumis and the bow and arrows that the local liberals used you know and uh, it stood them in good stead because when the dutch east india company lost its foothold in india when martanda verma the picture that you see uh, uh, destroyed the dutch navy's uh, dutch navy in the battle of kolochil in 1742 and captain delanoy uh, who was the captain uh, he surrendered to him and uh, he employed him thereafter in his uh, state forces and help them modernize uh, the travancore army and that's the travancore army that stood up against uh, tipu sultan's forces when the invasion of south india had started off uh, kerala had started off by tipu sultan he created a line series of lines and barricades called the delinoy uh, the the travancore lines and uh, nedam kote lines which uh, which was uh, which consisted of fortifications and strongholds just the way the portuguese had held on now what was intriguing is that they, they were like portugal was so far away and yet they managed to subdue an entire the population of uh, asia was five times the size of western europe you know it was 57 million europe and uh, and and in that portugal was uh, relatively smaller in the sense it was very small and uh, <clears throat> but the capability of them to hold a series of fortifications create them establish them and then hold it actually the marathas learned that and they used that in their fortifications when they established a network of fortresses that they created uh, to fight the mogul domination in south and another great thing that we all uh, today know bombay as a very very vibrant city 
it was uh, it was a set of islands that was gifted away uh, honestly because they thought it wasn't really uh, were fruitful to hold on to it but catherine braganza uh, well, it was given as dowry to uh, by the daughter by by the king of uh, portugal to king charles ii today it is our financial capital it is uh, the capital for our uh, movie stars it's a dream city of dreams for everyone it remains and uh, the foundations were actually laid by the portuguese who uh, handed over this as a dowry to the and then of course uh, the presence of uh, francis xavier who started missionary schools and others so the printing press made its advent into india and uh, that's something that modernized the education we had those presses in not only in goa and other areas but also in kerala and uh, that explains how you know education and then they catalog the people who came in from there well uh, you started cataloging these important medicinal plants and other uh, uh, tribes of india and others they started cataloging and you the print it made books available easily for people to read earlier it was all on palm leaves you know and palm leaves and they couldn't really make copies of them so they were records that were engraved very carefully and it was not so this this advent of this was a uh, and then uh, christianity as we know uh, not as from the saint thomas's followers not the syrian christians but the ones that were brought by the catholic uh, portuguese was introduced here in the regions they also brought tobacco from uh, south america and other areas in america and then they brought cashew nuts goa custard apple bread food potato or batata as it is called and tea drinking also sorry to interrupt but uh, uh, dpk you will have to wind up soon yes it's done the herbs and spices became popular and then of course the there were the uh, jesuit priests who were uh, who were actually uh, fond of the mangoes and the king of all mangoes you know it is said that thousand things that you should eat before you die out of them is uh, alfonso mango and that is uh, something that we owe to them and uh, that comes brings me to the end of my presentation so thank you sir well that's a terrific coincidence that i kind of uh, uh, zeroed in on you uh, at about the time that you were actually uh, ending your presentation but may i compliment you dpk pillai on your presentation and for actually making us feel like all of us are in one of those sailboats uh, you know moving towards india uh, with the help of the monsoon winds you know that's the way you kind of walked us through a piece of history uh and i of course uh, still debate whether it's the alfonso mango uh, which is better or whether it is the kesar mango of the coastal part of of saurashtra where the portuguese came which is uh, better so let that remain uh, a, a debate among us and the portuguese uh, but thank you for that presentation now look we have come to the end of the first session uh, and uh, uh, we need to see if there are any questions address to uh, the speakers uh, so far i haven't seen anything specifically over here uh, but i am ready to uh, take uh, a question or two um, and if the audience doesn't have uh, anything yet ready by way of a question uh, may i uh, ask the panelists if they want to ask each other something or is there something that you wish to ask our distinguished uh, uh two ambassadors who have joined us um so i leave that uh, thought with you um if there isn't a question uh, then i will straight away move into session 2 where we still have uh, very good uh, speakers lined up so may i take it that there are no questions at this stage and that there could be as we move down the line um but thank you dpk pillai i mean you really uh, you know gave us a a, a good mo vasco da gama and i i actually want to thank you for pointing out that it was uh, uh, one of my uh, you know uh, paisanos a uh, gujarati who actually uh, took vasco da gama uh, all the way to calicut uh, so as a gujarati i am proud of that little piece of history that you shared uh, thank you both uh, our speakers uh, ambassador uh, mendes and colonel dpk pillai uh, for that excellent session friends i now move over to uh, well i see a red dot there so let me see hang in there please um it seems there could be a question when there's a red dot it means there could be one oh i'm trying to see if there is any 
All right. It doesn't seem like uh, it says Q and A. I don't see any questions here. But anyway, I now move into session two, uh, which is uh, focused on strategic and economic impact of the Indo-Pacific on India and Portugal. Um, actually, the chair here uh, is not me. It is Dr. Uh, Nuno Canas Mendes. So may I request the director of the Instituto do Oriente to kindly introduce our two speakers, that's Ambassador Sandeep Chakravarti uh, and the others. Uh, I count uh, them as my friends, Dr. Constantino uh, Xavier is also here, apart from Dr. Carla Guapo Costa. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Mendes, uh, my co-chair, uh, and I uh, thank you all kindly uh, once again the non-speakers will kindly mute their mics i'm muting mine over to you uh, dr mendes you are the chair for this session okay thank you thank you ambassador chinoy so we are going to start our session two on strategic and economic impacts of indo-pacific on india and portugal and our first uh, speaker is the ambassador uh, Sakravati. Let me present him. Um, Ambassador Sakravati is, is the joint, yes, yes, is the joint secretary of the European Division at the Ministry of External Affairs and uh, he is a member of the Indian Foreign Service since 96 and served in India's missions in Spain, Colombia, Bangladesh, Peru and the United States. Prior to assuming charge of Joint Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs in July 2020, he served as Consul General of India in New York from uh, 2017 to uh, 2020. Um, he was also a diplomat at uh, Lima from uh, 2015 and 2017 and ambassador of India to Peru and Bolivia. Uh, earlier, he, he had been India's deputy chief of mission in Bangladesh from 2012 to 2015. Um, he, he has held several positions at the ministry. Uh, he has a master's degree in advanced studies in international security from Geneva University, a master's degree in sociology, a postgraduate diploma in forestry management, and an undergraduate degree in physics. So, uh, a very um, interesting and rich degree. He's fluent in Hindi, Bangla, and Spanish. Uh, and of course, his spare time he reads up on international relations and the environment. Um, so, uh, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Shekhrabati. And um, the floor, the floor is, is yours. You are going to present uh, um, a paper on an Indian viewpoint on strategic and economic impact of Indo-Pacific and role of India in Portugal. Thank you. So is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Nuno Kanas Mendes. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be on this panel and I've been hearing with a lot of interest uh, the opening uh, session uh, by uh, Ambassador Chinai and the other ambassadors and uh, and uh, of course uh, your words and then uh, a very interesting perspective uh, uh, by Luis Felipe Castro Mendes and uh, DPK Pillai. But uh, as, a, as an Indian, I cannot let uh, pass uh, the remark uh, made by Colonel Pillai and Ambassador Chinoy on the mango. I will differ with their uh, preferences and I would say that being from UP, the sherry mango is the best. A mango in the world. So I think we can carry the conversation offline later on. I'm uh, very happy that uh, IDSA and uh, Instituto de Oriente have, have, uh, have collaborated on this, uh, uh, on this uh, event and it's in some ways a, a, a curtain raiser or, or should I say a flagging off event in the new year when uh, 
Portugal has assumed the presidency of uh, the European Council, and we are uh, all set and preparing very, uh, uh, very um, strongly and furiously for uh, uh, the unprecedented India-EU uh, leader summit that will take place uh, uh, at the initiative of the Portugal presidency uh, uh, in in Porto in in May. So a lot of preparations are going on uh, in 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 Delhi, in other other cities, and in the European capitals, and we are really looking forward to. Uh, to uh, that event. Now, in this context, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, assumes importance. Uh, we all know that uh, Indo-Pacific is, is a very recent concept, and I would I dare say that it is India's contribution uh, to the foreign policy uh, narrative, to foreign policy lexicon. I don't think um, uh, we have had uh, this kind of a seminal contribution before. It was used sparingly now. It is being used by uh, many experts, academicians. Uh, the fact that in 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 in, in a think tank event, uh, uh, this Indo-Pacific is, is is one of the uh, you know panel discussions. It shows that uh, the concept is arrived. It is not a, a very old concept. It, it's maximum ten to fifteen years old, and and now it is becoming part of uh, the discussion in in many uh, foreign offices. Um, our understanding is that 50% uh, of the global trade um, uh, passes through or traverses uh, the Indo-Pacific maritime domain, and 60% uh, of the world's population uh, live in, 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 in on the shores of the Indo-Pacific. And uh, we believe that it is important for the security, stability, peace, and prosperity of this vast region that uh, Ambassador uh, Carlos uh, had mentioned that we want to see uh, more of India and Europe, and uh, India uh, wants to see more of uh, Europe and India. So I think the Indo-Pacific is a is a fantastic construct, uh, which will allow um, uh, us uh, to see more of Europe uh, in 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 our shores and in in and in this region. I think it is important uh, from every perspective, from the strategic perspective, because in the past we have seen uh, when other powers were not present in this region, uh, some very negative outcomes have. Uh, have have uh, been arrived at, and uh, one good example is is the South China Sea, where uh, the world saw uh, what was happening in the South China Sea. But uh, leading powers at that time chose to look uh, the other way, and we have seen what has happened uh, in the South China Sea. So I think this is a very good rationale uh, why we want to uh, see more of uh, in uh, uh, other powers and other countries involve themselves uh, in the Indo-Pacific. In the Portugal context, I would uh, like to say that uh, uh, we don't have a Portuguese, uh, um, uh, what should I say, a guideline strategy or policy on the Indo-Pacific. It may be there internal to Portugal, uh, but we don't have an enunciated uh, uh, Indo-Pacific policy. But we have seen in the last uh, several years, starting from the French uh, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy in 2019 uh, to the German Indo-Pacific guidelines, uh, which came out in October, and uh, then we saw the uh, Netherlands, the Dutch Indo-Pacific guidelines, which came out in November, and and the Dutch uh, uh, Indo-Pacific guideline is very interesting because it is building and making a case uh, for a European Union Indo-Pacific uh, strategy and, and 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 policy. And uh, we are informed, and uh, uh, my Portuguese friends will uh, correct me if I am wrong, that uh, Portugal is keen that the EU enunciates its. Uh, Indo-Pacific policy, and I believe that discussions are going on between uh, the Portugal uh, and and the EU, uh, other uh, in the EU Troika and in in Brussels on on an Indo-Pacific policy. So we are uh, looking forward uh, to the enunciation of uh, EU-wide Indo-Pacific policy, and 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 uh, I think Portugal's role uh, will be critical because uh, it is not only uh, the Council uh, President but also uh, uh, Portugal will hold. Uh, the India EU leader summit uh, in May. Uh, I don't want to get too much into history. I, my time is is, is limited. But uh, India has been uh, Indo-Pacific power. Uh, India, India historically, uh, uh, I think that is one reason uh, why uh, uh, you know Indians uh, reached out to, to other shores and also European powers came uh, to India. And and uh, we were listening to the presentations of uh, Colonel Pillai where where he he said. How uh, 
the European powers came to India and, and uh, I, I remember a few years back I had been to Bandel uh, where uh, there's a church, uh, Carlos, you must visit that church. The church was uh, built in 15, the Bandel is, in, is near Calcutta uh, and it was built in 1599, it was a Portuguese church and uh, then it was burned down by, uh, by the Mughals and later on Shah Jahan gave money for its reconstruction. So very interesting uh, anecdote of uh, Indo Indo Portuguese history uh, is also seen not only in Goa uh, but also in the eastern coast uh, of India in as far uh, uh, as far as in in, in Bengal. Now uh, I will uh, like to just highlight a few uh, aspects of our Indo Pacific policy and where we see coincidence between uh, some of the European policies that uh, uh, we are aware of. Uh, as you know. Um, our policy is, is uh, basically encapsulated in, in two concepts. Uh, one is uh, the Sagar doctrine of our Prime Minister uh, when uh, he, uh, he used it as an acronym for security and growth for all in the region. And, and uh, through the Sagar, and the Sagar doctrine is operational. Uh, we are reaching out to our partners and I think a very good manifestation of our Sagar doctrine was seen during the COVID times when India reached out uh, uh, with, with assistance. Uh, our Navy reached out, our, our Air Force reached out, and we provided uh, support and assistance to the small island states uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific region. And I think uh, the COVID um, uh, time was a very good uh, opportunity. It means all challenges and crises are opportunities. Uh, and I think COVID was an opportunity where India was not only, uh, was basically walking the talk in terms of implementation of its, its Sagar doctrine. We further uh, uh, developed our Sagar doctrine and in 2019 in the East Asia Summit in Bangkok, uh, Prime Minister announced the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. And uh, there are seven pillars of the initiative and I would like to just highlight them. They are uh, maritime security, uh, maritime ecology, maritime resources, capacity building and resource sharing, disaster risk reduction and management, science, technology and academic cooperation, trade connectivity and maritime transport. I think uh, on pillar six, we are already moving uh, through through this uh, this uh, seminar where, where two academic institutions are, are collaborating and talking about the Indo-Pacific. Now, India has acted on these principles, uh, both in thematic and in uh, through geographical initiatives. We have sought to strengthen security and freedom of navigation in the, in the, in the Indo-Pacific by becoming a net security provider. For instance, uh, we are doing peacekeeping efforts in the, in the, in the Gulf of Aden. And I, and I already mentioned uh, what we did uh, uh, during 2020 in the, in the COVID times. We have also, uh, we believe in an in, in inclusive approach to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we believe that we can work with multiple partners. And to give an example, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, we are working in the Quad with uh, Japan, uh, United States and Australia. And uh, I am personally involved in, in one such architecture, which is the India, uh, France, uh, Australia trilateral, whose first meeting was held in, in, in August of last year. And we are now looking uh, towards a ministerial of, uh, of, uh, of the trilateral in, in, in the coming months. So great deal of cooperation in various architectures uh, are happening. We are uh, cooperating also bilaterally with the countries in the European uh, Union who have enunciated their uh, Indo-Pacific guidelines. Uh, France, as you know, has appointed an ambassador for the Indo-Pacific. So our discussions with France are, are quite advanced. Uh, Germany has come out with its uh, Indo-Pacific guidelines. Uh, we are also working with Germany and, and uh, the, the Dutch um, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, policy is very recent and we're looking at how to engage uh, with, with the Dutch. I, I would uh, just uh, uh, get into a little bit of detail on the Dutch uh, policy because I think uh, uh, this is a basically the blueprint or the uh, initial uh, building block of the European uh, uh, Indo-Pacific policy, which is very interesting if, if the Europe comes up with this Indo-Pacific policy. Uh, and, uh, and the Dutch paper, if you look at the Dutch paper, it's publicly available, actually talks a lot about a European or a Europe-wide Indo-Pacific policies. And there we find a lot of uh, coincidence between the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative of India and, and what uh, the, the, the Dutch paper uh, enunciates as, as uh, or, 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 or uh, uh, 
projects or, or, or as, as the European policy. So the Dutch has uh, six broad elements of a future, Indo, uh, future EU strategy, a strategic vision for the Indo-Pacific, security and stability, working with partners in the Indo-Pacific region, sustainable trade economics, effective multilateralism and international legal order, sustainable connectivity, and meeting global challenges of climate and SDGs. Uh, if you do an analysis of uh, the three policies that uh, uh, we have seen, the Dutch uh, uh, chairman, please uh, uh, warn me if I'm exceeding my time, and I, I will quickly try to adhere to the time. Uh, we find a lot of coincidence between uh, the Dutch, the French, and the, and the German policies. The French is more strategic because uh, France is a resident Indo-Pacific power. The German um, guidelines are more uh, oriented towards uh, trade and commerce, uh, about, about economic cooperation, also also uh, inclusivity. And the Dutch uh, focus is more uh, trying to take along other European partners in engaging uh, with the Indo-Pacific. But I would like to uh, highlight that uh, whichever uh, policy you see, whether we see uh, the 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 Dutch policy, the French, or or uh, the, the the German, or even the American uh, and the Japanese, and right now even uh, the the United Kingdom, although it has existed the EU, it is still a European power, and and we engage with with all of Europe. Uh, they are also uh, they have established an an Indo-Pacific Commission, uh, which has come out with its report, and uh, I believe that uh, the uh, the report of the Commission will will form part of the government's. Indo-Pacific policy. There also, uh, there is a uh, there is a very distinct tilt towards India. So what I was trying to say is that all these policies have India as a major partner, and they see India as as uh, playing a vital role in in the Indo-Pacific. And we find that uh, as other powers get more involved in the Indo-Pacific, whether it is for economic or in uh, for strategic stability. Uh, we welcome uh, the, such such initiatives, and we feel that in a multipolar world, uh, we we believe ourselves to be a pole, and we believe that a multipolar world uh, will be achieved only by a multipolar Asia. So when when European powers and uh, other powers uh, talk of an Indo-Pacific uh, policy, or or they talk about the Indo-Pacific, uh, we believe they are looking at a multipolar world, and we also believe. They're looking at a multipolar Asia, and such a construct, I think, is good for uh, safety, security, and stability in the Indo-Pacific and in the world. So these are my initial uh, comments, and uh, uh, I want to thank uh, the Portugal presidency for pushing and nudging uh, the EU uh, towards coming out uh, with its policy. And we hope that we see it uh, before uh, before the summit, so that we're able to react to it. And that, that could be one of the interesting agenda uh, for discussions between the EU leaders and Prime Minister Modi. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chakravarti, for such a comprehensive view. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. And now uh, I will give the floor to my dear colleague, Professor Carla Costa, uh, who, who is a um, full professor um at the school of social and political sciences and uh, she's also a researcher at orient institute at, and at the center for administration and public policies she has a phd degree in economics by the institute of economics and management uh, of the university of lisbon uh, her main research areas are international political economies, uh, specifically European economy and financial um, crisis. She authored several books and papers in national and international uh, um, journals, and she's currently working on consultancy missions to African Portuguese speaking countries and East Asian former Portuguese colony Timor-Leste in the field of economic development. Her presentation uh, will be on India, Portugal and its impact on geoeconomics. Professor uh, Carla Costa, um, the floor e is yours. Thank, thank you, Nunu. I'm sorry. 
Thank you, Noon. Good afternoon, distinguished ambassadors, my fellow colleagues. Uh, first of all, I'd like to present my apologies for having been late at the beginning of the session, but I am experiencing some serious technical difficulties. So I hope everything goes well. I'd like to say I'm very pleased to be here as a researcher at Institut de Orient from the School of Social and Political Sciences in this first, which I hope to be the first of many others, virtual bilateral dialogue. I'd like to thank the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis and the Institute to Orient for the invitation to participate in this dialogue. I will try to develop a geopolitical and geoeconomic analysis in what concerns the relations between India and Portugal. I do believe that the geoeconomical analysis of the global economy and of relations To make some previous remarks on why I consider the geoeconomic perspective to be such a powerful tool in understanding the current global economy. In fact, the merging of, merging of geopolitical and economic goals, especially the use of the economic policy and its instruments to achieve primary goals of geopolitical strategy, is becoming more and more frequently an important factor of state policies, the so-called economic statecraft, in the context of globalization or, in more recent times, globalization which the current pandemic crisis has certainly come to aggravate. In our days, the centrality of the economic dimensions can be asserted by multiple ways. Warfare is taking place of military strikes, the trade wars are replacing military alliances, the capacity of assure, assuring access or to block the access to strategic commodities and predatory economic practices, the beggar thy neighbor policies, work as substitutes, substitutes for territorial conquests. In this context, geoeconomics has arguably become an increasingly important aspect of contemporary international relations and geoeconomic priorities become dominant in the economic statecraft of several countries. The economic statecraft has been playing an important part in domestic and global economy as governments in all types of socioeconomic organization can change the end results by helping national firms to gain competitive advantage in world markets and being resilient enough in order to resist the unlevel playing field created by state-owned enterprises and the investment spree led by some sovereign wealth funds. In the 1990s, Edward Lutwak in the Seminar SEO argued that the emergence of geoeconomics can be translated as a mixture of the logic of conflict with the methods of commerce. He later argued that the geoeconomic approach would mean that instead of measuring progress by how far the fighting front has advanced on the map, it is worldwide market shares for the targeted products that are the goal. Later, according to Blackwell and Harris, joint economics can thus be considered the use of economic instruments to promote and defend national interests and produce geopolitical goals. In this geoeconomic and geopolitical context, Portugal and India are, from my point of view, two countries that have benefited from the process of globalization, although in different degrees. And the importance of the Indo-Pacific region in this realm is unsurmountable. As the Indian Ministry of External Affairs stated in a speech last December, denying the Indo-Pacific is tantamount to refuting globalization due to economic and geopolitical leverage that the region entailed to global economy and security. And in fact, it's quite easy to witness the importance that main players, regional and global, access to the economic and geopolitical features of the Indo-Pacific region, namely China, Japan, Australia, the Asian countries, US, European Union, and naturally India, which has been developing a series of initiatives within its geoeconomic and geopolitical strategy to retain influence in recently the launch of the Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative. I believe there are a number of areas where the economic endeavors and strategies of Portugal and India could articulate within the Indo-Pacific region, and by that way to contribute to expand economic, trade, technological, financial cooperation by matching the correspondent skills of the two countries. I will start by focusing on the Portuguese geoeconomic and geopolitical strategy. As far as the global contest is concerned, Portugal's position is indeed a modest one. It holds a small share in international economy and trade, Portuguese GDP and exports represented in 2019, respectively 0.3 and 0.35% of world totals. Also, Portugal faced some severe constraints in the last decades since it was plagued by unsustainable financial imbalances 
and deteriorating competitiveness, which forced the country to submit to harsh authority program for three years under the auspices of the EU and International Monetary Fund, with the 78 billion euros, that means about 46% of Portuguese 2011 GDP bailout. Amid the controversy and the drastic consequences on the social fabric, Portugal has come out as a reference of success in the international forum. And ever since, the country has been struggling to improve its integration in global value chains, in higher technological content activities, promoting the formation of human capital and growing value added. In what concerns this internationalization process and have to have been concentrated in colonial markets for trade and investment, Portugal joined the European Free Trade Association in 1960, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in 1962, and in 1986, it entered the European Economic Community. Today, it has a full participation in the internal market, and since 1999, sharing a currency, the euro, with 18 other states. This means that a country with 10 million inhabitants, but a truly global history, is a member of the biggest trade bloc in the world, around circa 38% of global world trade, the first source and host for foreign investment, one of the major technological hubs, an internal market of 450 million people, and a share of 18% of global gross domestic product. Economic integration has even more been an important geopolitical leverage since it, since it goes back far beyond trade rules to incorporate domains such as foreign investment, intellectual property, or procurement regulations, among others. And Portugal is one of the most integrated countries in the regional bloc. In 2019, over 70% of Portuguese exports and imports were concentrated in European Union countries, especially with our neighbour, Spain. If this was to be expected, given the sophistication of the integration process, it also represents, from my point of view, a vulnerability because it makes the evolution of Portuguese economic performance dependent to a large extent on the performance of European partners. Given the anemia of economic growth in all 27 member states, this sheds some uncertainty on the future. Call it From Portugal's point of view, India is the main driving force of the South Asian region with a buoyant demography and a very young English speaking population. It has been the fastest growing large economy in the global context, offering a set of opportunities, but also some risks. India has made a strategic commitment in recent years to structural reforms and to the strengthening of macroeconomic stability in order to attract foreign investment. There are substantial improvements in indicators relating to innovation capacity, as well as a significant performance in the entrepreneurship and a sustained path toward digitalization. It is a fact that the current economic relations between Portugal and India are quite feeble. In 2019, India ranked in the 16th position among Portugal suppliers and the 44th client. Portuguese imports didn't reach $1 million and exports were circa $141,000 using current exchange rate. In what concerns foreign direct, direct investments, the amounts were also modest since India ranks 50 as destination for Portuguese investment abroad. And if we look by India's perspective, the same conclusion applies. But the advantage of starting from a, the, a modesty of current economic relations is that there's a huge potential for growth and for a major geopolitical impact for both countries. I'd like now, I would like now to make some remarks on the role of the sea as a driver of geoeconomic leverage. From a memorial, the sea has been the center stage for geoeconomics and geopolitical disputes, a source of divergent interests and complicated diplomatic games. And in the beginning of the 21st century, there's a growing number of initiatives mostly led by powerful emergent economies that rely on the sea to power endeavors. India and naturally China are two of the most relevant players in these realms. India has undertaken initiatives to strengthen partnerships with neighboring countries in the Asia-Pacific regions. These initiatives, the act is being such as the Asian group, Japan, Australia, or Singapore, with a clear target of counterbalance China's influence in the region. The Indian government has been developing ways to improve connectivity, building roads and railways to, road, railways to enhance re regional trade. I believe the Act East policy is closely intertwined with another important pillar of India's geoeconomic strategy, the importance of India's maritime role. Not ignoring the importance of the Pacific, I would like to focus now on the Indian Ocean. Economically speaking, the global significance of the Indian Ocean is paramount, since it works as a hub for the economic growth in the surrounding region. 
It connects strategic trade routes, more than 60% of global oil trade flows pass through its waters, and its coast is home to 32 billion people. Additionally, the Indian Ocean is well gifted in natural resources, and it hosts 40% of all offshore oil extraction along its coastline, as well as 15% of the world's fishing activity. The resource of the Indian Ocean and its navigability safety are of special importance to India, given its dependence on energy imports. Portugal, in this context, uh, Portugal could be an energy interface to several countries with a port of scenes and the involving industrial complex for its own assets, being a central node in the world network for exports of American shale gas and tight wall, but also a recipient of LNG export from the Atlantic South and the Indian Ocean. In this context, Portugal could also emerge as a service provider in areas related to oil prospection and extraction, transportation, naval repairing and shipping to several countries within the Lusophone area that includes new sources of mineral resources supply, such as Brazil, Angola, Mozambique, East Timor, or Guinea. Portugal is a supporting in this association with the CPLP as an observer, and the country could also reinforce its position But I think that India could, um, Portugal, in the context of this project, the Sagar Mala project, and also the Mozam project, which aims to enable India to establish ties with its former trading partners and restore the world of the Indian Ocean along its coastline, Portugal could function as a connecting bridge, profiting from its relation with Lusophone, African states, and Brazil. India could also benefit from the fact that, from a geoeconomic and geopolitical perspective, Portugal could be the center of a tri Atlantic triangular strategy with Europe, America, Africa, with an important role in other emergence player strategies such as India. And India could also benefit from Portugal's potential for taking advantage of the blue economy to, due to Portugal's geostrategic position, its coastal extension, the dimension of its economic exclusive zone, research and development skills, maritime tradition and accumulated know-how. In this context, Portugal and India could engage in some joint initiatives aiming at underpinning the development of strategic mineral industries and the circular economy with a strong technological content. India could also benefit from Portugal's potential for taking advantage of the blue economy due to Portugal's geostrategic position and maritime tradition. Uh, Portugal skills can play an important role in the modernization of India's economy through innovation and technological assets. This cooperation is quite important since technological development is a game changer. It's a game changer in winning the geopolitical race. Several countries are put that witness the importance that all countries are giving to innovation as a means to overcome rivals. Programs such as Digital India, Industry 4.0 in Portugal or Made in China 2025 are uh, uh, clear examples. Portugal companies are already investing in India in areas that could be paramount to future geoeconomic and geopolit geopolitical advantages, such as facial recognition biometric systems, the case of Vision Box, or industrial machinery and equipment, the case of IFASEC, just to name a few of the many highly skilled technological advanced Portuguese companies that shows the India market as one of the main destinies of internationalization. And the same goes from the part of Indian companies investing in Portugal's in area such as chemicals, IT, hotels or petrochemicals. I believe Portugal has a golden opportunity to create vital geoeconomic spaces on the 21st century, holding a central location within the main networks of globalization, economic, financial, commercial, technological. And it needs to do so because it cannot stand, from my point of view, such a heavy dependence. This strategy cannot ignore the importance of the Indo-Pacific region. As Mr. Ashok Malik stated in Lisbon Talks last November, Portuguese traders invented the Indo-Pacific. Portugal and India share historical and cultural links going back to the 15th century, and many of those links are being reinforced by the Portuguese government, which has already made India the crown jewel of the Portuguese presidency with the holding of the EU-India summit. But we must naturally be aware that, no matter how strong historical and cultural links may be, 
they won't by themselves obtain a fruitful relation if the economic potential of the relationship is not explored. But it is also true that the cultural and historical links can powerfully boost the economic relations and play a decisive role in an integrated geoeconomic and geopolitical strategy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Carla Costa, for identifying the opportunities and the constraints of, of the uh, Indo-Portugal relations. Um, and now um, I will give the floor to our uh, last speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Constantino Xavier, um, who will uh, present um, his views on Indian Portugal points of Indo Atlantic convergence. Um, he, he is uh, a fellow in foreign policy and security studies at the Center for Social and Economic Progress in New Delhi where he leads the Samband Initiative on Regional Connectivity. He is also a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. His researches and publications focus on India's changing role as a regional power and the challenges of security, connectivity and democracy across South Asia and Indian Ocean. He also works on India's relations with the European Union and other democratic powers. Dr. Xavier <clears throat> has taught and lectured at various Indian, European and American universities, as well as various civilian and military training institutions in, in India. He holds a PhD in South Asian studies from the Johns Hopkins University and a, a Master of Arts and a Master of Philosophy from Jawaharlal Nehru University and the BA from the new University of, of Lisbon. Dr. Constantin Xavier, uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. Uh, we have met many years ago here in Lisbon. Dr. Constantin Xavier, yes, yes, the, that's right. I know the that. floor, Can you hear me well? floor is yours. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Nuno. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone here from Delhi. Pleasure to be here and special thanks to the two institutions that are co-hosting this, the Manoha Parikar Institute for Defense and uh, Studies and Analysis um, in the person of uh, Director General Ambassador Sujan Chinoy uh, and Colonel Pillai. It's a great uh, pleasure to contribute to IDSA where I was honored to be a visiting fellow many years ago. And of course, to Nuno, uh, to you and to your team, at the Instituto Oriente, uh, uh, where you had a fabulous program on Asian studies um, in Lisbon. So what I'll just try to do with my time uh, um, allotted here today uh, is I don't think I can contribute much because India-Portugal relations are on a phenomenal track. Um, I think on an excellent direction and a good pace, um, but it's, it's good to take stock of where we are and uh, I'll try to explain quickly to those that are yet not convinced about the potential of this relationship, why we are facing a unique window of opportunity for this bilateral relationship. And second uh, point, maybe to a few ideas, suggestions, uh, some more bold, some less bold, but just to, to push the relationship a bit forward. Um, in terms of um, uh, fleshing out this potential. So I think on the window of opportunity that also brings us together here, I think that's a manifestation of, of the deepening ties between India and Portugal. Uh, I'd like to highlight four quick reasons to explain why we are really um, in a very special moment of India-Portugal relations. One is uh, the depth and unprecedented close proximity at the political level, at the highest level between both prime ministers. Uh, and I would risk saying, I think with quite much confidence, and I hope everyone agrees that never before have two leaders from India and Portugal had such a frequent and close relationship as Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Prime Minister Antonio Costa. So that is unique, that is unprecedented, and that is extremely important um, uh, uh, opportunity facing us. And it's also a responsibility for us to, I think, translate that political mandate and direction and fleshing it out in many sectors and strengthening the bilateral relationship. 
Number two, um, and the first panel was very interesting on the history um, of this relationship. History can bring uh, countries and nations together. Um, it can separate them. It can leave bitter taste. Uh, and I think what we have reached over the last 10 years, and particularly over the last 15 years and the last few years too, is a mutual confidence in engaging forward without uh, keeping, without, without losing the past and building on the past to build a stronger future between India and Portugal. This was all, not always the case, which some people here will remember. There have been problems between India and Portugal in the 20th century, the colonial question, Goa, normalizing relationships. Even in the 2000s, even today sometimes, the past is a bit of a burden for this bilateral relationship. But I would say that we've crossed a tipping point and Portugal has learned to let go of Goa. And I'm not saying that we should abandon Goa. It's an important place, uh, not the least because that's also where I trace my own personal origins to. And uh, many of us recognize the importance of that territory. But on the Portuguese side, we see a pragmatic approach that understands that relations with India should not be held hostage to Goa, the past, history, political, ideological issues. And more interestingly, vice versa, on the Indian side, over the last 15 years, we've seen a progressive embracing of Goa and actually valuing the importance of history as an asset that can be leveraged between India and Portugal. So I'm remembered, in fact, of Ambassador Luis Castro Mendes, who played a crucial role in the bilateral visit of 2007, uh, where a joint statement uh, emphasized it from the Indian side. This is uh, 14 years ago now that uh, the Portuguese legacy in Goa, Daman, and Diu, and across the subcontinent in India is something that is cherished and celebrated from the Indian side. That was unique language in decades of diplomatic relations. Um, that was manifested also in Goa hosting the Lusophone sport, sports games, for example, for the first time. So India hosted uh, these sporting games called the Lusophone games. Um, and on, on a variety of other initiatives that I'll come back to in a second. Third uh, reason why this is such an important moment, uh, the European Union-India relationship is uh, having a new vigor. It's been 20, 20 years since the, the first summit that had been held in Lisbon. I'd say the 2000s were a good moment for EU-India relations. Then we had a slow moment, I'd say between 2010 and 15. And I think since 16 onwards, we're now on an upwards trajectory again. Um, so that gives Portugal and India another forum, another channel to uh, deal with each other and strengthening in particular the importance of multilateralism and regional cooperation and the rule of law through institutionalized cooperation. Fourth and not last, uh, uh, not least, um, Ambassador Carlos Marques, I think, mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, three crucial words. He spoke about Portugal recognizing the importance of multipolarity, a balanced world order, and a diverse set of relationships for Portugal and the European Union, if I may assume. Um, so I think these three concepts, multipolarity, balance, and diverse set of strategic partnerships are at the heart of India's foreign policy of the last 70 years and focused on the concept of strategic autonomy, which I think uh, Mr. Chakravarti also brought up. And both the European Union and Europe as a whole, and Portugal as a constituent of that project, and India, embrace the importance of strategic autonomy, which is more important today than ever because we are facing uh, a change in world order. We are in fact between orders. I think we all are clear the old post-Cold War order uh, is in shambles, but we are not sure what the next, uh, the, the terms of the new world order will be. And this is where the European Union and India and Portugal and India will play a very important role uh, not to, uh, to shape this new order and not to rely on any single or even two sets of actors in the world order. So having that, having emphasized why this is so important, this relationship, let me um, propose six points where I think uh, Europe, Portugal and India can build um, and expand their uh, bilateral relationships. Number one, I think we need to focus on hard economics and the importance of economics first in an economic interdependent world as we are today. Economics must come first. In fact, economics is security and not the other way around. 
uh, all other aspects are very important, but if the European Union in India and if Portugal and in, in India don't deepen their economic engagement, um, they will not be able to push the relationship forward. And here are two suggestions. One is something I've been observing over the last 20 years in the Portugal-India relationship. Um, the importance of a business and Indian uh, of a business and industry confederation uh, or representation of uh, the private sector. We've had many attempts on the Portuguese side for an association or such type of confederation. They have failed. They've never picked up picked up here in, in Portugal, in India also uh, difficulties on that sense. So I think it's high time that on both sides we have a strong body that represents vice versa the business interests of Portugal and India and the business interests of Indian companies, SMEs, big, small in Portugal. And that needs to be a strong uh, um, push from both sides. And it's high time we had that. The second suggestion on this hard economics on the first point is something that came up, but um, uh, you know, the free trade agreement between the European Union and India has seen ups and downs. Now there are talks about talks again. Uh, the Indian Minister of Commerce and the high level uh, representative of the European Union for Commerce, the Commissioner for Commerce met, I think just a few days ago. We see the European Union signing an investments agreement uh, with China. Um, so I think it's imperative that we reach May and that something comes out of the summit that uh, reinvigorates the economic relationship through some type of a roadmap towards an agreement. There may not be a trade agreement. Uh, we saw the foreign minister of Portugal mention, I think, a week ago that possibly this could be an investments protection agreement, but high time that something happens on that front. Two, second proposition is on the softer side of economics. So I spoke about trade, investments, tr et cetera, but on the softer economic angle, I see tremendous potential on science and technology, uh, a focus on innovation and entrepreneurship. These are issues that the Portuguese governments over the last 10 to 15 years have emphasized repeatedly. I think in India, there's a great momentum towards uh, cultivating a scientific culture of innovation uh, with economic objectives here in India. And this requires, I would say, and this would be my suggestion, a massive program of exchange of scientists, technological experts, scholars. Um, this is something the Portugal-India relationship needs to invest in dramatically. We need dozens of top scientists from Portuguese universities spending time in India from medical issues, energy, uh, um, uh, economics, uh, technology, artificial intelligence. There's great work being done in Portuguese universities, but I don't see enough Portuguese professors, PhD students spending time at places like IIT, Indian Institute of Science, um, et cetera, and economics departments. And vice versa, Portugal will need to attract a very specific uh, number of talents from India to be exposed to the Portuguese system and the European system in, in, in Portugal. Uh, on this also, I think the blue economy is critical. I think we've spoken about this a bit today, but Portugal has a new national strategy for uh, the sea. In fact, the second iteration of the Portuguese national maritime national, national sea strategy is now being uh, discussed. And I think it'd be very interesting for India to discuss Sagar uh, and its maritime efforts with the Portuguese efforts to develop an integrated strategy to develop uh, its exclusive economic zone, which is huge, by the way, uh, possibly up to 4 million square kilometers. Many people don't realize that in India, but the blue economy is a critical, I think, uh, angle for the Portugal-India relationship for these reasons. Third, on the strategic aspect, I think Mr. Chakravarti spoke eloquently about the importance of the Indo-Pacific and how India looks at the Indo-Pacific, and I can only emphasize that it's uh, important uh, for Portugal to continue, which it is, to invest in a European strategy for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, there will be many European visions of the Indo-Pacific. That's normal. There are always many European visions on anything. That's, that's it's the strength, that's not the weakness of Europe, the diversity. But uh, it is time that uh, Brussels comes out with some type of a vision. If ASEAN has done this, if the Dutch have done this, I think Brussels will also be capable to do this in close consultations with its member states and with the inputs from the member states. But uh, on the second front, on the EU-India flag, on the, on, on the India strategy, I think the importance of democracy. Uh, and I think Portugal and India and the EU and India uh, need to emphasize that democracy is not just a philosophical concept, it's not just a moral luxury, 
this is a system of governance that has is at the heart of the European experiment success, and is it is at the heart of the Indian Union's tremendous economic, social, and political and security success over the last 70 years. So translating that into a vision of how to preserve democracy and democratic governance on issues like cybersecurity, data protection is key. Uh, at the same time, also how to support other countries in Africa, across Asia, that are weaker democracies, younger democracies that are struggling with support for the institutions. That is an agenda that the European Union and India uh, must embrace, uh, and I hope the Portuguese presidency can take that forward. And finally, on connectivity, the European Union has a bold connectivity strategy. In fact, it was launched with the presence of the former prime, prime minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, unfortunately not an Indian representative. But here in India, there's a great interest in connectivity issues, regional, uh, continental, intercontinental. And as we get into a more interde interdependent world, despite the pandemic, it will become more integrated. It's time that I think the European Union and India have a joint approach to connectivity and discuss the terms of that connectivity. And that's why democracy is so important. Fourth recommendation I would submit is as a provocative title, Nunu, you had mentioned, uh, you asked me for something provocative, so I came up with the Indo-Atlantic. Uh, I'm a fan of the Indo-Pacific. I don't want to undermine the Indo-Pacific in any way, but I think for Portugal and India in particular, the heart of their strategic focus is actually what I have been calling over the last 10 years, the Indo-Atlantic, with Africa at its heart and the Middle East and Europe. So I think I would say that a, a, a good focus on Africa is needed, whether the bilateral relationship between India and Portugal or the EU-India relationship. In fact, the EU-Africa summit has been delayed. The India-Africa summit has also been delayed. Let's see what happens on that. But hopefully, I think there, there could be a joint partnership and agenda toward development cooperation, investments, coordinating infrastructure investment in Africa, uh, blended finance. These are all issues that India, India and the European Union and Portugal are looking at. And Portugal, as we know, has always had a soft corner for the European Africa policy and has played a very important role, including by hosting a former uh, EU, EU Africa summit in Portugal. Fifth, uh, something that you will have to listen to me again. I've been saying it for the last 13, 12 years, uh, and I'm happy that things are moving finally in this direction, but because they're moving well, I'm going to up the ante and ask for even a more ambitious agenda. For the last 12 years, I've been pushing for India to join the Community of Portuguese Speaking Countries, CPLP, uh, as an observer member. The CPLP is akin to the Francophone uh, Initiative or to the Commonwealth Organization, which India has joined since its beginning uh, because of its own colonial experience under Britain. Uh, finally, it seems that both prime ministers have set out uh, the agenda for India to uh, join CPLP as an observer member. But there are many observer members. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Georgia is an observer member. Japan is. Uh, several countries are. Um, and I think it's time, therefore, to upgrade this into a demand that India should become a full member of CPLP. If Equatorial Guinea is a member of CPLP, and without minimizing Equatorial Guinea's important colonial history or Portuguese speaking mm. culture, identities, etc., mm. India has a much stronger case to make to join the CPLP and play an important role in that. And not for only, again, some moral or historical baggage, but because of its economic interests, its geopolitical situation. In fact, mm. many Indians uh, who visit uh, Timor-Leste will remember and know that mm. Timor has been pushing for India to join the CPLP and says India must join this Lusophone club because it's important we want to develop these relationships that we've always had over centuries between Timor and India. And that is important. Last but not least, Nunun, I'll end at this. The last proposition, the sixth one, is on defense and security cooperation, since we are being co-hosted by IDSA and its important role on defense, strategic, and security issues. Uh, there's been great developments on defense industry cooperation between Portugal and India. At the European level, India has been very interested in what's happening at the PESCO uh, uh, level in terms of a joint European approach to defense industries and scientific collaboration. Uh, but I'd say the naval angle here is critical for Portugal and India. The maritime sphere is really where these countries can cooperate. Whether it's building up a new maritime museum here in Gujarat and in India, which has been, been discussed, 
Uh, but also, let me just dream again, if you allow me for a second, why not an Indo-Atlantic naval forum of the littoral coasts of Africa and India, uh, all the way from India to Portugal, all the coastal states, um, maybe every two years, a good discussion am among the navies of these countries that are all keen in learning both from Europe and from India in issues of maritime domain awareness, coastal patrolling, uh, defense modernization. This would put Africa once again at the heart of the Indo-European and Portuguese-Indian partnership. Thank you, Nuno. Well, um, I want to actually thank uh, the chair, Dr. Uh, Nuno Canas Mendes, uh, who very ably chaired this session, and I also want to uh, thank uh, all the speakers. We, have not, we are not doing too badly for time. I mean, we are a little uh, beyond our time, but then that's par for the course for such uh, webinars that uh, take a deeper dive into important bilateral relations. So I suppose you'll all bear with me. Um, before we go to the concluding session, where I do want to make a few points, um, and some of uh, my points may actually echo uh, points that have already been made, uh, but nonetheless, I shall do that on behalf of, uh, uh, you know, the MPIDSA side. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, I want to quickly read out a few questions and we will not have a long Q&A session because most of the points have been covered. But I'll be unfair to the participants if I were to ignore them completely. So there is one question from Matthew Simon uh, from our institute. And he says... Uh, uh, taking a cue from the past, uh, what are the best ways uh, to bolster people-to-people -people ties in the present times? And I'm wondering if uh, 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 Ambassador Luis Philip Castros Mendes would like to briefly comment on this, given your uh, vast experience with our cultural and civilizational ties. Uh, the next question, uh, which is there, is uh, from uh, the Portuguese side. It's uh, Bernardo Cunha, who says, can it be assumed that the colonial fight for Goa was uh, an aberration or a deviation uh, of the, or from the traditional uh, sort of profile or presence of the Portuguese who until then kind of had supported the local Indians against what, what he terms as, uh, you know, Muslim powers there. Uh, I, I'm wondering if uh, DPK Pillai, you want to briefly comment on that and uh, maybe anyone else, uh, Dr. Carla, maybe, or uh, Constantino. I mean, I'll leave it open. If, if you want to speak, just raise your hand and I'll give you the floor. Um, Shiv Kumar Singh uh, from among our audience wants to know uh, if uh, Portugal can open up its universities and institutes, which have very good infrastructure, uh, to Indian students looking for good courses. Um, he is talking about in English. Well, I think it's time to do some courses in Portuguese as well. Um, and, and that's how we will uh, do even better uh, with uh, Portugal in the future. But medicine is being cited as one of the courses that Indian students might take in, in Portugal. Uh, so someone could reflect on that as well. Um, let's have a quick round and then we will get into the concluding session. So who wants to take off first? Uh, um, Ambassador Luis Philip Castro Mendes, uh, a minute for you. Actually, I'll yes. run through all the speakers if yes. anyone has something to say. Well, well, uh, people to people uh, relations are uh, the, the, the important and the best way to to develop the our uh, cultural inter cultural interchange. Cultural change uh, if we see each other, if we uh, see uh, our movies, our plays, our music. If you listen to our music, uh, it's the, the best way to know, and you read our, our writers, it's the best way to know about uh, us. About the role of the past, history, uh, well, uh, there are some uh, cathedrals in Goa that uh, are really uh, uh, the place for that cultural meeting that was created not only between Portuguese crown and Portuguese state, but also uh, with Portuguese church, which and Catholic Church, of course, uh, which has an importance in the uh, cultural uh, melt of uh, 
uh, India. About the question put by Mr. Cunha on the, Muslim, the role of Muslims, I think it was... Uh, it, it, uh, it is very clear that the, the, the main food, the main enemy of the Portuguese in the 16th century were the Muslims. But I, I don't think that in, uh, uh, out of this period, and uh, say uh, for uh, thinking on today, uh, uh, relations uh, that uh, way of thinking could be of any of any use. I think it's just uh, it, it happened that uh, that that period of time. And I'm sorry, perhaps Colonel Pillai have some more some better ideas about this point. Thank you very much. Thank you again, uh, DBK Pillai. I agree. Uh... Hello. The the conquest of Goa was not actually scheduled. Uh, it is not an order from uh, the king of Portugal. He uh, Albuquerque was only ordered to capture Hormuz, Aden, and Malacca, so as to prevent the Mamluks from interfering in the thing. Mamluks had collaborated with the Venetians, who had actually lost its significance, and uh, they said that even after they spoke to the Pope about allowing uh, the trade to happen. Then they asked the Mamluks to deal directly with the uh, kings of uh, India. And actually, uh, the Sultan of Bijapur had rallied uh, the people in favor of uh, the Muslims had been rallied to fight the Portuguese, Portuguese invasion uh, dominance. And uh, the invasion of Goa took place merely on Albuquerque's uh, initiative. It is not an order from the king. So you, it, it is, uh, it also, while it helped, it was actually aided by local uh, uh, Timoji was the local general who uh, uh, met him already through the king of Calicut, Zamorin of Calicut. He also for forewarned him about the preparations that are taking place in uh, Bijapur uh, and in Goa when uh, was captured. They actually discovered a large number of unfinished ships and a large number of garrisons. So uh, it, it did support, it did, like all the colonial powers did support local Indians and played uh, politics one and one against the other. The British perfected the art, but uh, for the, the Portuguese also used this uh, to establish themselves more firmly. Thank you. Uh, I will now request uh, uh, Sri Sandeep Chakravarti um, to perhaps, uh, you know, make a comment for a minute or two and also to uh, say something about whether the government of India uh, has, uh, uh, you know, any plans to collaborate with the government of Portugal to promote uh, the uh, teaching of Portuguese in India, uh, apparently under the new education policy of the government of India, uh, Portuguese has been included. And so will Portugal be helping in this regard? And also, if you want to reflect on uh, the aspect of, uh, of uh, connectivity or, or students going to Portugal, anything you feel you wish to uh, elaborate thank you sir uh, no i was just trying to ascertain uh, the points uh, made by constantino about uh, joining that uh, con uh, the confederation or the or the, uh, the council of portuguese speaking uh, uh, countries and i think we we have made the application i think the summit could not be held because of covid and uh, in the next summit uh, we will we will be joining as as observer so that is very much uh, on on the cards uh, as far as uh, people to people sir uh, the, there was a question uh, how can we post uh, people to people uh, relationships and contacts in, in 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 the european context in general and uh, in portugal in, in particular what i want to say is that uh, one of the strategy that uh, we are following in uh, as part of the government of india initiative is to conclude uh, migration and mobility partnership agreements with a large number of countries and uh, you will be happy to note that the discussions with Portugal are quite advanced and, and uh, we are planning to hold um, uh, meetings now. And the drafts have been exchanged and uh, uh, Portugal has come out with a very novel, uh, I must uh, say, approach to the whole thing. And, and uh, uh, we believe that uh, there is a lot of commonality of, of, of understanding and we may conclude uh, an MMPA with Portugal uh, sooner than, than later. And uh, so we will be holding negotiations uh, with Portugal very soon. But, but apart from Portugal, we are trying to do the same thing with several other countries. We already have one with France and uh, we are even trying to negotiate one with, with, with UK. And, and so these uh, agreements help in mobility of, of students and professionals 
and I'm sure once uh, uh, we do one with Portugal, uh, it will facilitate movement of uh, of uh, students. The point to, to note is that students uh, uh, go to a foreign country uh, on some several factors, not only uh, the quality of education, which I'm sure is very good in, in Portugal, but they see uh, convenience of language. And uh, secondly, they also look for internship and job opportunities. Uh, so if, if a country offers the entire package, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, then, then sometimes or many, or oftentimes uh, the language barrier can be broken. If, if, if a student can go and, and, and learn there and do internship and also scout for jobs, then even if the, the education is important in the foreign language, people are willing to, uh, to take that uh, challenge and, and do it. For instance, uh, we see people learning German first and then going and studying in German universities because they, they see a, a, a roadmap and, 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 and a path forward. So I think if countries come out with such um, uh, options, uh, people will take and Portugal uh, is certainly uh, on the cards. Lot of uh, traffic in the India-Portugal corridor and I think I must credit must go to the two ambassadors. In fact, sometimes it becomes very difficult for us to track what is happening. And now with the leaders summit coming up in Porto, I'm sure all of us will see a lot of, a lot of action uh, on, on India-Portugal ties and um, we suffered a, a, some kind of a, a delay because of COVID. A lot of things were planned, uh, including um, a hackathon between students, uh, which was planned last year, but could not be held because of COVID. And we plan to do it uh, in the coming uh, weeks, if not uh, uh, in the coming weeks. And so you will see again the, the clock and the, and the counter ticking very, very frequently as far as India and Portugal is concerned. And uh, and I'm sure with Manish there, uh, he must be he must be very excited and all set to go. And as soon as COVID uh, declines a bit in, in Portugal and, and in India, uh, we will see much more happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now turn to Dr. Carla uh, to have uh, a last word on what has been said so far. A, a quick few bites from you. I'm really sorry because I, I, I didn't catch all the... the no, what I meant is if you wish to say something my, my, by way of a few concluding remarks on all that has been said so far or any of these questions that have cropped up, would you like to say a few words? I really didn't get the, the, the questions, as I said, because I, my, my internet closed down. But uh, I'm I not just... Sorry. Maybe you can reflect on, just... yes, uh, how to enhance... Uh, uh, let's say specifically uh, trade and economic ties. Uh, how do we get more uh, okay. you know, Portuguese investment and, and how do we push people to people uh, engagement? Okay, thank you. Well, as I, as I try to, to presentation, I, I, I think that so far, both uh, India and European Union, and especially and maybe Portugal, has it, uh, a part in of, of economic relations. And so I think that uh, Portugal has relied too much in less on the economic part. And I think it has come the time, and I think the, the Portuguese presidency like cultural and economic issues, because uh, we can have them apart. I mean, we, we do have a, a common history and cultural issues are very important. But if we don't promote, if we don't promote the trade and investment uh, relationship, then I think that uh, won't be. In but if we match the two of them, I think we, had, we can have a serious win-win uh, partnership here. And so I hope that it, the, the Portuguese uh, presidency of the European Union to enhance that win-win um, partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much. I agree with you. Trade and economic uh, ties will provide the real ballast for our relations in the 21st century. Now, Tino, as far as you're concerned, there is a question also on connectivity. Connectivity is absolutely vital, so says uh, Andrea Valente. Uh, and um, uh, China has apparently uh, put forward its own vision of connectivity. Uh, as you know, in her uh, view, uh, uh, Gateco is an example of that. Uh, does India have any similar plans or policies in your view? Yeah, thank you, yeah. Ambassador Tinoy. Um, so I'll just focus on that because I think Ambassador Manish Chouan, Ambassador Carlos Marques must be tired of hearing so many good suggestions from all of us. So I, I really just focus on the connectivity thing and uh, Mr. Chakravarti too, I'm sure 
the agenda is full. And as I want to stress again, the relationship is just excellent and is going in such a good direction and such good space, uh, such a good speed. But uh, to Dr. Andrea Valente's question on connectivity, you know, I think if you look at connectivity to physical connectivity, you can do that. And China certainly has done a lot on building physical infrastructure. But I think the comparative advantage uh, for India and the EU on connectivity is to look at these soft dimensions of connectivity. Um, and let me give you one example, for example, where uh, I think India and the EU are not keen in adapting to an American or a Chinese model on data security and data governance, for example. The American model is very private driven, private sector driven, very libertarian in that sense. The Chinese one is the exact opposite extreme. It's a statist model of control uh, of data. Uh, and I think here the European Union and India, not, but not through coincidence, because reflecting again their own histories, have been working very well on, on data governance that has important implications for e-commerce, for example, and then for trade investments. So I think uh, uh, there's maybe no exact big macro policy from the government of India towards connectivity, but if you flesh out issues like this one, for example, on the softer side of connectivity, there will you will find tremendous interest across the Indian government, across Indian civil society, across Indian businesses to work to connect closer with the European Union, including Portugal. Thank you very much, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This really brings us to the concluding session, uh, where I would like to request uh, my <clears throat> co-chair and counterpart. Uh, uh, Dr. Nuno Kanas Mendes to actually take the uh, floor first. We'll tweak the program a bit. Um, and in doing so, would he also kindly reflect on uh, a query from uh, Mrityunjay Dube, uh, uh, who actually referred it to, uh, to someone else, but I would like you to reflect on it. How do you see India-Portugal relations unfold uh, in the Indo-Pacific post-pandemic, especially if there is any idea to involve uh, the, the youthful populations in the two countries. Uh, anyway, it's a long uh, sort of drawn question, but uh, you might just refer to it in passing. But I turn to you now to deliver your concluding remarks, uh, whereafter I shall uh, also attempt to uh, not actually summarize the proceedings, but make a few points that came through very clearly in the course of our engagement. Over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador Shinoi. Uh, I would like to to finish my my intervention uh, with a, with a few remarks um, on this event and on the, the relations between uh, European Union, Portugal, and and India. Um, let me say that European Union and its member states have been under an increasing pressure from from Washington. To commit, to commit themselves directly or indirectly to the Indo-Pacific. Biden's new administration and the most recent investment agreement signed between the European Union and China are major achievements to be taken into account uh, in future deliberations and, and positions. And I think Europeans should identify realistically their economic security and normative interests in, in India. The rivalry between United States and, and China um, will remain, as well as the pressure towards European Union will, will face a new conundrum. Um, I think Indo-Pacific is still used uh, in, a, in a very securitized and geopoliticized perspective, besides the term being, uh, in my opinion, a descriptive economic term for underlining the, central, the centrality of, of Indian Ocean and India in a more accurate way than Asia Pacific. And uh, I think it's now time to, to define concrete goals and, and priorities. Um, the fact that Portugal is chairing the European Union uh, and uh, its responsibility of, of promoting an environment 
where multilateralism can be and should be reinforced. It will be a, a challenge to the European Union to show the ability to, to dialogue simultaneously with United States, India and, and China and to stress the need for more balanced connections with, with these with this partners. The meeting, um, the meeting between India and the European Union in uh, May uh, at Oporto, despite all the uncertainties, uh, the, 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 all the uncertainties and the uh, COVID um, environment, uh, can be a springboard to, to debate uh, difficulties and limits to negotiate and improve. And there are a lot of issues trade, investment, uh, market access, um, cooperation for WTO reform. So I hope that the summit will be a, a step forward. Portugal has historical relations with India and the potential to design a bilateral relationship between uh, bilateral relationship, mutually advantages and trade, investment, science, technolo te technology are, um, in my point of view, among the multiple sectors that should be uh, expanded. I, I would like to finish um, congratulating all the panelists for their contribution, Ambassador Carsten Mint and uh, Dr. Pillay on the impact of Portugal and India relations through history until today, and uh, the, the reflection made by, uh, by Ambassador Chakravarti, Professor Kost, and Dr. Xavier on strategic and economic dimensions of, uh, of Indo Pacific and how we can place the relations between India and Portugal in this major issue of international politics. So, I thank you for your uh, attention um, uh, it was a pleasure to participate and to hear all these interventions, so interesting interventions. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Nuno Canas Mendes. Uh, uh, and like at the very beginning, I am about to outdo you in terms of the uh, uh, time that I will take to make my few remarks. So I hope you will bear with me again. You were most generous at the start of this conference and I seek your indulgence once again. Uh, now look friends, it's uh, not my, uh, you know, uh, sort of attempt to summarize anything uh, for much has been said uh, and many profound statements have been made by experts. Uh, but I think it is important to take stock of some of the main strands that emerged and that is exactly what I will try to do in the next few minutes. Um, uh, the first point that emerges is that uh, uh, in this age of, uh, uh, shall we say, renewed globalization, post-COVID-19 pandemic globalization, uh, India and Portugal will have to go beyond the ancient, uh, you know, sort of primer uh, of uh, civilizational contacts. And, and we have to look for new paradigms. Uh, of engagement and uh, trade and economic uh, engagement uh, is going to be one of the key uh, ballast uh, uh, for the relationship. Uh, many other areas will also provide that kind of ballast. Both Portugal and India face uh, this challenge of uh, uh, wanting quicker growth uh, and uh, faster development for their uh, peoples. The global situation uh, is going to remain in flux for the foreseeable future uh, and uh, it is therefore important that uh, our two countries uh, as co-members of the G20 uh, and particularly taking uh, you know advantage of the fact that uh, Portugal is uh, holding the presidency of the council uh, for uh, some time uh, in the future as in uh, till June 2021 this is an opportunity for us to look at enhancing not just bilateral cooperation but also the multilateral cooperation. We must expand that multilateral space while we are 
uh, in this comfortable uh, situation. Uh, we can use you as a docking point in the EU. Uh, you can also use us as a docking point in the uh, UN Security Council. So we must work together on sustainable development, renewable energy, uh, terrorism, uh, non-traditional issues, etc. As for the Indo-Pacific, I think uh, really Portugal does not require an invitation uh, or even a cajolement uh, by the United States to do more. Uh, I mean, you are a natural fit for the Indo-Pacific, historically so. Uh, so you could take to it literally as a duck would to water. It is uh, well known now that uh, the global economic growth has shifted to the broader space of uh, Asia for some decades now. Uh, and China's growth story is well documented. But there are other remarkable stories also in this uh, space that we now recognize as uh, not just Asia specific, but the broader space of the Indo-Pacific. We have, for instance, growth that is spreading all the way across uh, Southeast Asia to South Asia and to Africa. And this is how it was before the pandemic struck. And it's only a matter of time before these trends pick up very rapidly in the post uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, situation and scenario. And so that is where I think uh, Portugal also needs to, uh, in my view, develop its own Indo-Pacific vision and uh, not just on behalf of the EU, but its own vision of the Indo-Pacific and seek to connect uh, with uh, all of us in this region. Um, Asia, Africa, Latin America will continue uh, in the near future to remain regions of high growth potential. Uh, and uh, personally, I feel that our best partner in Europe uh, could be uh, uh, Lisbon. Uh, and, and you need to uh, regard New Delhi as your best partner in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the signing of the potential uh, you know, conclusion of the social security, uh, 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 sorry, the joint uh, declaration on mobility and migration, um, as well as the social security agreement, I mean, these would be win-win uh, uh, sort of outcomes uh, that can tap into India's demographic dividend while catering to Portugal's need for a skilled uh, workforce. Uh, and as uh, speakers have mentioned, uh, uh, the defense sector is something very important, uh, which is now in India open to 100% uh, foreign direct investment. And Portugal has uh, well-recognized strengths in aerospace and defense manufacturing, which is of great interest to India. Uh, and since we have uh, increased this limit in the defense sector for investments to 74% uh, and even higher through the government approval uh, rate, uh, we urge uh, Portuguese companies to come in and uh, form uh, joint ventures and partnerships in this field. Naval cooperation has also been mentioned. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we need to look closely at what we can do together, whether you're vessels and assets when they come to this part of the world, whether we should try and uh, have a regular mechanism for engaging in uh, PASEX and other exercises, maybe port calls, uh, and make that a routine feature. Port calls become a routine feature in that case. Uh, as for the Indo-Atlantic Naval Forum, I think it's a very interesting idea, uh, but we should also look at uh, whether we uh, go into that straight away or whether we first consolidate uh, the Indo-Pacific, uh, 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 you know, concept. Uh, so that is uh, food for thought for, for scholars. Uh, I, I personally feel uh, very good points have been made about uh, India uh, not only focusing on deepening trade ties with Portugal, but especially so in the uh, context of the community of Portuguese language countries. The, the CPLP, um, you know, is something that we should actually dock into. Uh, and uh, we could actually use that to leverage our, uh, you know, shared Lusophone ties in Africa and Latin America through that platform. Uh, and frankly, uh, I would urge India to agree uh, to, uh, to sign on, but only on one condition, if Portugal agrees to play cricket with us. So if you yeah. agree to play more cricket with us and form your own teams, we will speak as much Portuguese as you want us to. Um, uh, I, I, I also feel that our Portuguese speaking populations in Goa, Daman and Deep, uh, such as uh, we have, uh, should really be able to provide some more of this uh, low cost uh, uh, back office and IT outsourcing uh, services to not just Portugal, 
but to the rest of the Lusophone world. So I would urge you to look at that. Blue economy, again, has been mentioned and as maritime nations, both India and Portugal must look closely uh, at actually seeking to work together in third countries, especially small island nations with which both India and Portugal are familiar in this broad swathe of the oceanic space. There is much that you are familiar with, much that we are familiar with. Uh, and so we must uh, hearken back to that historical period of uh, familiarity and see if we can do something together in small island nations uh, in accordance with their comfort level and in areas which are of priority to them, not necessarily to us. Uh, and so I come to also the big continent of Africa where we seem to have a common interest and we must explore the possibility of joint projects, uh, but not just the two of us. I think we can also look at bringing in other uh, well-meaning partners such as Japan. I think uh, uh, trilateral cooperation between India and Japan, a country with which I'm familiar, a country which also focuses on Africa through TCAD, there is scope here for Portugal also to step in, uh, given its own familiarity uh, with the region. So trilateral cooperation is also something we should explore. Um, anyhow, uh, the Blue Dot Initiative and Network uh, for establishing standards for infrastructure, is that something where we can also uh, sort of uh, uh, entice and attract uh, Portugal to do more or to come in and express itself? Um, so all this and more, I think, uh, is uh, awaiting us uh, by way of possibilities. Uh, the Atlantic International Research Center again, uh, provides a scope to work together in areas such as space and ocean science, where we have uh, observer status. Uh, I've said enough. It only remains for me to uh, once again reiterate uh, that uh, as think tanks, uh, we uh, owe it to our governments also to support them uh, in deep thinking and this kind of engagement on a regular basis. Uh, and I look forward to renewed engagement with you in the not too distant future. I also want to thank uh, both our ambassadors, uh, Ambassador Manish Chauhan and Ambassador Carlos Pereira Marquez uh, for finding the time to actually join us and sit through so patiently. I want to thank Ambassador Sandeep Chakravarti, Joint Secretary from the Ministry of External Affairs for his support and for also uh, spending the whole afternoon with us today uh, and not the least each one of our speakers. Once again, a very big thank you to you. Until we meet again, please look after yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.